If you're still here though, we'll have a night of worship tonight. But we are so excited to worship again with you. I, um, I just pray this has been a week that you have heard from the Lord. You've seen what we do here at Karis, what God is doing here, what He wants to do in your life. We just take a moment and bless the Lord and thank the Lord. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We worship you. Thank you for what's been said, what's been spoken, your word that has been sown into the hearts. I thank you, Lord, that it falls on good ground, that we truly hold on to what you've done this week, what you've begun this week. And I thank you, Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for moving. I thank you for your goodness. We worship you. We honor you. Have your way.
out the name of Jesus. Jesus. you hug and speak the name of Jesus over them, say hello, speak life and love. We'll have a video for you guys and we're going to keep going with this last day of campus day. I went through a major health battle when I was 15. I became legally blind and profoundly deaf for almost two years. Uh, it was due to toxic mold exposure compounded by multiple sports injuries. I actually began my journey really strong uh, with trusting that this wasn't gonna be my new normal. I was believing that eventually I would walk free again, but I grew weary as one thing after another after another chipped away at my hope. At my darkest moment though, in the middle of that season, God spoke to me and he said, you can focus on everything that you've lost or you can start to dream my dream for you. Uh, he showed me a ministry of a ranch that was his dream. It was his dream for me. Uh, I started to share this with my mom and when I did, it just started this domino effect of favor and connections leading us to launch a ranch established to connect the broken and hurting youth with abused and neglected horses. In this environment, it was so beautiful though because the hope uh, was reignited in me uh, to become whole and fulfill my purpose again. I started to picture myself seeing and hearing and living without pain and I began to actually speak it over my life and that was where that critical moment God met me where my faith was. Um, infirmities began to fall off of me. My DNA was rewritten. My vision and hearing went back to normal. In April 2019, I learned about Karis through attending a musical performance and it revolutionized my world. I completed my first year of Karis through distance education and my second and third years at the main campus in Wildham Park. God doesn't disqualify you if you're in process. 
He gave me the vision in the middle of my mess. And during my third year at Global Training School, I was actually able to relocate the ranch that God showed me in that vision seven years ago. Um, Eighth Mountain Ranch is the name. And I've used the truth that I've learned here in Karis to bring redemption and sanctuary to others who are in the middle of their messes and to give them the opportunity to have a new beginning in Him. Wow, wow. <laughs> Wasn't this worship just amazing? Like Andrew would say, how do you top that? How that do you was... do anything normal after that? You can't. I know, I'm still trying to it's compose like, myself. Yeah, my goodness. Well, for morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to day three of Campus Days at Kiris Bible College. Our for those of you day. guys Woo. who are joining us online, welcome. We're glad you guys are joining us. Man, this, this morning was just, I'm still trying yeah. to like compose myself, so forgive me, I'm like a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this has been awesome. You know what, it's like I was, we were singing that song, Worthy is the Lamb. You know what, it's like, I pray that when we get to heaven, I can sing that song. I can sing that song, just, just Lord, I wanna just undo myself in front of you and just like, thank you, you are worthy is the Lamb. That is Amen. so awesome. You know, it's like, oh, Amen. man, this worship was just awesome this yes. morning. I'm wow. sorry, this is just good. You guys enjoyed Campus Day so far? You ready for more? Yeah. Can I see some of the hands that are people that have already signed up to Keras? Look at that, guys. Come on. That's fantastic. Your life will be forever changed. I promise you that Amen. it's going to be awesome. And Amen. I'm excited. We just speak a blessing over the journey that God has for you. Yes. Because it's going to be good. And so if guys, you're still, if God's still tugging and you're like, but Lord, um, finances, job, move. 90% of the people who've come to Karis, maybe even more than 90%, have taken that journey ahead of you already. Guys, does it work out? Yeah. So don't be afraid. Take that step, God, wherever you are. That's where he is, all right? Where yeah. you need him, he's that there. Is. So take the step. Yeah. Amen. Um, Andrew, we're talking about like the next steps and that. And we mentioned, I mentioned this to Andrew a little bit in the green room. But you know what? Even we prayed about what was our next season. We start, I started Keras online. Um, and then we moved to America. And I was like, I just felt like God's like, get connected with Keras. And we prayed about it and everything. And I went to the Orlando campus and I was like, no, that's not where God wants me. I didn't even know what the Jacksonville campus looked like in Florida. And I was like, I just felt like, you know what? God wants me to go. And we had a five by eight trailer and we just got in our cars. In we got in our cars and we went to Jacksonville and we didn't even have a place to stay at the time. We went there and we just like started looking around for yep. a place while we were there and we found a place we're there. We were a six year old and it worked out. Yeah. It always God is works good. out, guys. It always works out because God's good like that. God is good. Yes. God is good. Amen. So yeah, so guys, man, I think Rachel's, Rachel's uh, testimony there is just awesome. We need to dream big. I think okay. we limit God with our small thinking. You know, I, must, I was sitting there and I was like, what am I already dreaming? I'm dreaming the day that I can sit with my beautiful wife on my porch. We're in our old age, old fogies. I'm not gonna be a grumpy old You're man. Gonna I'm gonna be, be an a old good old fogey, not me. Okay, <laughs> I'll be the old fogey, but I'm, I'm imagining myself sitting on a porch with my wife at an old age. My son and his family is worshiping the Lord, loving the Lord, serving the Lord, and we can sit down and we can say, thank you, Lord. I've, I've, I've run Amen. my race and I'm good. You know, I'm seeing myself already. It's like I'm praying for hundreds of people. I love praying for people. So I'm seeing myself doing that and I get excited about that. You know, so this book is all about that and it's helping you. You need to see yourself where you wanna be. You need to see yourself healthy. You need to see yourself prosperous. You need to see all these things. If you can't see it, you ain't gonna have it. Okay, so you need to imagine big. So this book is all about that. So Hi, Matt, can we please give this to people that don't have an imagination? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's a few that don't have it. We're good at acrobatics and all that kind of stuff too. All right. Okay, so where is our beautiful Julianne? Come on up, lovely lady. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
Yes, yes. Okay, so I have a few things to say. Um, during worship, a beautiful lady came up and gave me this, and I feel like it's for, uh, for everyone that works here as well as everyone who attends here and those of you that are planning on attending. It says, I see Jesus. He has his big arms wrapped around this campus. He is smiling, and surely he is in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that great? That's awesome. And you know, Amen. as I was listening to Andrew speak, I was reminded of the CEO of the ministry, Billy Epperhart. I was listening to him minister, and he was talking about working with Andrew, and he's like, the, he's the only man that he knows that will, by faith, hear the voice of God, and then as soon as he knows he's heard the voice of God, he instantly steps into trust. Trusting that God's going to bring it to pass. Trusting. And so I was thinking about that this morning as I was listening and, um, and I was like, yes, Lord, that's what, that's what I wanna do, right? I wanna know that I've heard God's voice and then instantly step into trust that he's gonna bring it to pass. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And that's the way he works. And that's the way he operates. And that's the way most everyone who's come to Karis has yeah. experienced, right? Yes. We just that's have to exactly trust. True. Okay, so we're Amen. doing another drawing. And I, before I do a drawing, I want to make sure you guys remember we have Karis Fair today. So if you're worried, you shouldn't be worried. <laughs> If you are thinking about a place to live, right, a job, maybe a local church, that's where those connections are made. And plus, there's divine connections happening all over the place here. Amen. And so you're going to meet other people that are walking through it with you, and God's just saying one step at a time. And hey, I'll let me introduce you to this person who's going to walk with you. And it's pretty powerful. Amen. So let's so, draw... Julian. Where yes. is that Karis Fair going to be? Oh, it's going to be over in the barn where the student activity hub was. It is over there. We did a flip last night, and so it's a whole new world over there. A whole new, new world. world. Oh, no. The worship team needs us. us. They, they need do, us. totally, right? <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, for those of you that are thinking about your next step, listen, we got the booth open to take your applications. <laughs> you can still take advantage of the $500 tuition discount for on-campus, new-to-campus fall. 2023 students, okay? So let's do a drawing. We're going to do biblical worldview racism. That's awesome. It just came out on Friday. And guess what? I have an in, so I got two copies that we are going to give away. So let's draw. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Dear Lord, please let it be a name I can read. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Yes, we need two of them. One and okay. two. Okay. Are we I can ready? read these. Okay. All read right. Them. Kaylin Claridge. Yay! Yay. Yeah. Yeah, man. Praise God, and you're wearing your sweatshirt. Yes, that's awesome. I love it. You guys need, I see all the sweatshirts. It's so fantastic. So we'll have that at the booth for you. And what's the other name? Gabriella Bucci. Did I pronounce Bucci Yay. right? Yay! Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, you guys, you I think you. that's everything. Well done. Okay. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. There we go. Okay. You know what, I, I liked what Carrie said. I was sitting in one of Carrie's classes the other day and she says, if, if you knew you weren't going to fail and God's going to help you not fail, okay, you had all the resources and you had all the people to come alongside of you, what would you do? And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be thinking big. I'm thinking of all the things that's going to happen. Amen. And that's how we need to think. That's Amen. just awesome. This is awesome. This yes. is all good. Guys, just a reminder quickly that the Campus Days has been recorded and will be recorded. And if you want this, please go. Yesterday's session. Who enjoyed yesterday's session? Woo! That was awesome. And today we have Barry coming up and we have Lawson. So, oh my goodness, it's going to be good, guys. So, please go get the recording of the Campus Day so you can re-listen to that because it's going to be really worth it. All okay? right. Okay. Well... Would you stand to your feet as we welcome our founder and president to the stage, Mr. Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Man, it has been one powerful week. You know, the praise and worship is just so powerful. That word that... Um, Julianne was sharing, that's great. You know, I've been just so thankful. I wish, it was like that song they were singing, sometimes words just fail, but 
man, I'm just so thankful for what happened. I had a guy come up today and say, thank you for not quitting. And I was saying, man, am I glad I didn't quit because there was a lot of time that there was not much payback there. And now you just see these lives change like this testimony we saw. I can look any direction around here and there's just miracles every single place. I am so thankful. And you know, I was just thanking the Lord and uh, thanking him for all of his blessings. And the Lord told me that he's thankful he didn't quit. You know, we don't often think that way, but he could have quit. But you are his payback. This worship today, people worshiping him. It says in Psalms chapter 22, verse three, that he inhabits the praises of his people. And I can guarantee you, Jesus was here enjoying your worship and praise. And he was just, he's feeling just like I was. He's so thankful that he didn't quit. <laughs> and he's inhabiting the praises. Isn't that awesome? And I'm going to give you a last opportunity to give this morning. If they'd come and pass out those envelopes uh, while I'm talking, that would be good. And let me just summarize 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. There's no way I can hit all of those things. But I want to get to the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. It says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And did you know that all of chapter eight and all of chapter nine is talking about finances? It's the most information in one spot in the Bible on the subject of finances. He starts off praising these people because out of their deep poverty, they abounded and there was great liberality. Most people don't even connect those two things. But these people, they begged uh, Paul to take a gift for the saints that were in Jerusalem. And he was praising God for that and talking about how God would bless them. He said that, uh, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor so that you through his poverty might be made rich. And he just goes on and continues to talk about that. In the ninth chapter, he talks about that uh, he sent uh, Timotheus, I think it was, or Titus, one of those guys, before him because he had bragged on the Corinthians about what great givers they were. And when he came, he didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want them to be embarrassed. So he says, make ready your offering so that when I come, uh, you know, they will see the liberality that you've had. And then he says that if you sow a little, you reap a little, you sow a lot, you reap a lot. God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. And then in verse 10, he says, God gives uh, seed to the sower. Man, what a great passage of scripture. God doesn't give seed to just people that sit on it and take it and use it. But if you will let it flow through you, if, you, if you'll let it flow through you, then God will just bless you and you'll have more than enough, more than just enough to give. So all of these things are said. And man, I've ministered on each one of these things for an hour at a time, but it all comes down to thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You know, one of the ways that you can just bless the Lord is through your giving. It's worship when you give. It's not just meeting the needs of some ministry or something. It's worship to the Lord. You're saying, Father, thank you for everything you've done in my life. And so I just want to use that approach today that as you give, I want you to just do this as a thank you offering for all of the ways that God has blessed you. You know, the Lord also spoke to me that there is somebody, there's probably more than one somebody that just got here and you ran out of gas, not physically, but spiritually. You just came here on empty and God has filled you up. And you know, this is an opportunity for you just to say thank you and to be able and to give back and to bless the Lord. And he inhabits the praises of his people. So Father, we love you and we thank you, Father, for your great love for us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for leaving the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to just talk about you and sing about you. But Father, you come and put your super on our natural and you just make things work. Father, we thank you for leaving the Holy Spirit and we 
give this offering today as just thanks for all that you've done, for the lives that have been changed and those that will be changed. And Father, we thank you and we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, it's been awesome. And it's not over yet. We got Pastor Lawson Purdue that's going to be up right now. So Lawson, you can come up here. I met Lawson when he was 14 years old. And we've been together more or less ever since then. Lawson went to uh, Lester Summerall School and graduated from there. And then he pastored in Kit Carson. Lawson actually helped train up Carrie Pickett. She was in his church. And so uh, Lawson was a big part of that. And then Lawson moved here and pastors Karis Christian Center. Actually, some people think he pinched the name Karis from us. I pinched Karis from him. <laughs> we were called Colorado Bible College and he started Karis Christian Center. And then when we started having uh, Bible colleges all around the world, uh, we couldn't call them all Colorado Bible College. So we pinched Karis from him. So... He's been a super blessing. And this man is one of the biggest contributors to our ministry. He's been nothing but a blessing to us. I love you, brother. You I are a blessing. You, You're a blessing to me. Nice Very looking fun. jacket there. I like that color. <laughs> so let's welcome Lawson Purdue. I don't see it in the shirt. What's that? I don't see it in the shirt. Oh, well, I lost it. That's a bad deal. No, I'll find it. No. I guess I'll just share for a minute while he gets his mic fixed. So uh, I'm uh, Aaron Purdue. I'm the oldest of the three Purdue boys, the best looking, the smartest, the... <laughs> Um, and this is my wife, Heather. I actually, if Karis Bible College didn't exist, I wouldn't have met Heather. Um, she actually moved here from Tennessee to go to Karis Bible College, and um, we met at church and started dating and um, got married, and I, I, we were married right before her second year at school, so I know that's not recommended for most students, but... Uh, I did not come here wanting to get married. I'm gonna tell you right now, that is the last thing I wanted to do. But when you seek God with all of your heart, what happens? He just, he gives you the desires of your heart, the desires that you didn't even know that you had. Amen. Amen. So if you're here and you're seeking the Lord, watch out. You never awesome. know what's gonna happen. Praise Amen. God. Here. Hallelujah. So I'm so thrilled to have, uh, to be here. And I wanna say, first of all, a, a, a great, Thank you both to Andrew and Jamie Womack. I dearly appreciate them. I, uh, I owe my life to them. And uh, Andrew came to Lamar, Colorado when I was just 14 years old. And I was a really ornery child. And my mother uh, prayed a prayer. And she had started going to Andrew's Bible study, but she said, God, I can't do anything with Lawson. Would you please help me? <laughs> and so uh, I went to Andrew's meeting and God filled me with his Holy Spirit and called me to preach. I began to understand who uh, I was in Christ and my life was radically, radically changed uh, for the good to the point that my parents worried about me uh, because all I did was uh, go to church and take care of cows. And uh, praise God. Um, but God really, really blessed me. And, and the word that I heard transformed my life. Um, so it, it was so good. You know, my mom actually, I, I was 14. I love fishing. We lived on the farm. She said, listen, if you'll go to Bible study with me, I'll buy you some fish bait. So, so she... Uh, she took me to Kmart and bought me some fish bait and took me to Andrew's meeting. And when I was there for the first night, Andrew, I was sitting on the floor. This little house was just so full. And Andrew held his Bible in his hand just like this before he started teaching. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, listen to this man. He knows what he's talking about. 
I was born again, but I was not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I had the Spirit of Christ in me. And so I started listening, that was 45 years ago. And I've been listening ever since, I've never quit listening, praise God. And you know, the message that really uh, stuck out to me that first night was that you don't need to be sick, poor, or defeated by the devil, but you can believe God. You've got a Bible full of promises that you can believe in. I started believing the Bible for myself and, and you know, I got radically, radically, radically transformed. Praise God. And my life keeps getting it transformed and it keeps getting better and better and better. Amen. And so I, I just want to say thanks to Andrew and Jamie. I'm very honored to be a part of the school, to be a part of their ministry. I love them and I appreciate them. Um, Aaron is my assistant pastor. He's my oldest son. Uh, Heather, again, went to Karis Bible College. Uh, God brought her here. Um, her mom and Deborah went about 10 years before she did. Deborah came to our church and Deborah pastors a church uh, near Shelbyville, uh, Tennessee. Awesome woman of faith, awesome, awesome woman of God. And, and, and when Heather came, Aaron couldn't keep his eyes off of her and so on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It wasn't Heather's desire, but uh, God changed her desire. So I love them. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, but I have so many people, Javier and Alicia Macias, uh, our graduates, stand up guys of the Bible school. They're my youth uh, pastors, my youth directors. Uh, Damon and Renee Peterson, where are you guys at? Stand up wherever you're at. They're right here in the center with their son who volunteers for Stand Up Damon and their daughter, Dara. And Dara um, actually volunteers at the church, but she's gonna be a new student. And Damon, uh, I believe, you know, worked here at the ministry and ran the financial department of the ministry of AWM CBC for like 15 years. You know, he worked here for 15 years and ran the financial department for part of it. And now he works for me and runs my financial department and manages my office and does a fantastic job. Renee went to media school here and she's the head of my television. Uh, Nate Carter went to school here and, then, and Nate is the, is the head of our tech department. So I wanna just say a big thanks to Karis Bible College and Andrew and Jamie for the investment you know, that they've made into our church and our ministry and all these leaders and different ones. But I am uh, greatly uh, indebted to uh, Andrew and Jamie and Jesus, praise God. Uh, for what's happened. And so we love you all. We appreciate you. And I count it a great honor uh, to be here and to speak on this platform and to be part of the school. I currently teach four classes and I do a little bit of extra things here too. Besides those, I teach two first year classes, uh, basic Bible doctrines in the book of Romans. Uh, in fact, Romans is my favorite book. And uh, it's talking about righteousness by faith. Come up here, Javier. And you can give this to somebody, but uh, the revelation of righteousness. Praise God, I could teach you that in about two minutes, but I teach it in eight, eight hours here at the Bible school. And it is my favorite book. My favorite chapter is Romans 8. And my favorite verse is Romans 8, 11. The spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you. He'll quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. Um, I have some other teachings here. I have one on the dragon, the bear, the beast, and the king. I, I taught this before that Ukrainian mess, and I talk about the dragon, China, the bear, Russia, the beast, the antichrist, and the king, Jesus. How many of you are glad that Jesus is the king of kings and Lord of lords? He'll reign forever, but I taught that at the first of last year. People love that. Praise God, give that to somebody, raise your hand up. This is Heather's teaching on I'm born for this. And Heather's a great pastor. She's a great teacher, a communicator. Uh, you know, really has a great pastoral gift, care for people. And uh, she did tell me the other day because I was sharing on the gifts of the Spirit and motivational gifts and, and, and ministry gifts. And I said, I'm not very strong in mercy. She said, I want to stand up on the front row and say you're a liar. <laughs> she said, you're one of the most merciful I people that, that I know. That was a lie, not <laughs> Anyway, some stuff makes me mad once in a while. But anyway, Heather says, I'm very, very merciful. Give that to somebody. Uh, this is uh, my wife, Barbara. She can't be here because she's watching our granddaughter, Ada, Aaron and Heather's daughter, uh, Ada this morning. And uh, it's on present to heal. It's great teaching. 
Give that to someone. Uh, praise God. All right. And then this is a great teaching. Uh, Aaron just taught this Wednesday night. And it's one of the best teachings I've ever heard on healing. On healing is the children's bread. Andrew, do you listen to CDs? Would you like this? I would like to give this to you. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. And then I have this. I have confession cards and we have them on provision, healing, who you are in Christ. And on a new one, Barbara it has written a book and we're getting the final things done to it on imparting success to the next generations and confessions that she made over our children. And so uh, that one, I guess they ran out of, but you can get it from our church. You might be able to get it uh, from the bookstore. I gave a whole bunch of them to the bookstore. So you can give that confession card. You can get those out there uh, at the table. We ask for your email address if you want to give it to us. But um, praise God. And then this book, Provision. And this is my latest book. I am writing one currently on the grace life and I'm excited about it. But this, this book, Releasing Supernatural Increase in Your Life. Um, really, Jesus has really, really changed my story. And uh, I'm gonna do something out there. Everything on my table uh, today, you can, you can have what you want, take what you want, okay? On, except for this book. For this book, you have to pay full price. And it's $15. And it's worth every bit of it. And these principles, it's worth much more than that. These principles are principles that I taught to my children. Aaron is my oldest. He's my assistant pastor. I, I don't pay him that much, but Aaron is a, a millionaire. Uh, my middle son, Andrew, is 34. He, he goes to Billy Epperhart's church in Denver or Brant Epperhart's, Billy's son's church, help, help Brant plant that church in Denver. And uh, he's a multimillionaire. And my son, Peter, uh, is in Miami, Florida. Uh, he's in a good evangelical church that's reaching their community for Jesus there. Peter is the vice president of uh, Burger King of the Americas. And he works for the 25th richest man in the world uh, for 3G Capital. And, and Peter is a millionaire. So God's done this for all my children and I haven't given it to them. You know what? I wouldn't have to pay Aaron and Heather anything. And, and he told me when he took the position, Dad, I'm not coming and it's not about a position and it's not about a paycheck. It's about I am obeying the call of God on my life. Amen. In fact, uh, he studied... He studied um, Music at a very high level. He studied at Carnegie Mellon and got his, uh, under, his undergrad, his BA. And then he start, studied at Rice and got his master's and doctorate. He's played in some of the largest venues in the world. And when he made the decision to come uh, work for me and become my assistant pastor, he was playing in Washington, D.C. He was handpicked to play there at the National Flute Convention uh, of five of the top players in the world. He was handpicked to be there and he made that decision there. He'd been praying about it for three months and he said, God told me this is what I'm to do and it's not about a paycheck. It's not about a position. It's about this is what God has called me to do. In fact, prior to that, he had been, he, he spent three summers at Santa Barbara, California at one of the, probably the premier young adult symphony and you have to audition to get it in, in the world and he had a dream, I believe it was while he was there, and he saw himself standing in front of our church in Kit Carson playing his flute, and people gathered around him from all the nations of the world. And then he put his flute down, and he began to lay hands on people and minister to them, and they began to get delivered and healed, and he said it was a great field. And God gave me the interpretation of that dream. That dream is he's working in a field that I planted, but it will grow and it, his ministry will actually, actually go farther than mine, affect more people than mine. And he'll see many, many people healed and set free and delivered by the power of God and saved. And so, um, <laughs> praise God. But anyway, I, I want to give this, I want to give this Javier to this man right here in the blue shirt, right there. <laughs> praise God and say thank you. God bless you. Okay, you guys can go sit down. I love you. Thanks for coming up here. Um, I have a question for you today before I start. Do you have a dream? I believe that God has a dream 
for everyone. And I believe that we can live out the dreams of God. And shortly after, you know, I went to Andrew's Bible study in Lamar, Colorado and received the Holy Spirit. And, and when I received the Holy Spirit, I knew immediately that this is what I was going to spend my life doing. I knew immediately that I was called to preach the gospel. Now, I couldn't have told you all the different aspects of it, but I actually knew certain aspects of my ministry, some which did not come to pass for over 20 years that the Lord revealed to me immediately when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. In fact, I personally believe that when you're born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, that the ministry on the inside of you is full grown. But it actually takes a lifetime to walk it out. And it's kind of like Paul. I mean, when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, when he met Jesus, Jesus arrested him <laughs> on the road to Damascus. Jesus said, I've appeared to you for this purpose and for the things that I'm going to show you. And I actually believe that a lot of people, even though they get started in their dream somewhere along the road, they get mixed up or messed up or something happens and they ultimately don't fulfill what God has called them to do. In fact, Kenneth E. Hagin said this. He said he believed most ministers of the gospel never get to their full potential. They never get ultimately to where God called them to go and what God called them to do. And, and I believe that God gives us wisdom along the way. In fact, in 2006, Andrew Womack gave a word over Barbara and I. And Andrew told us that we were in the second stage of a five-stage plan that God had for our life and ministry. And, and as I prayed about that, God showed me what the five stages were. And he said the first stage was the church in Kit Carson. The second stage he said, was the church in Colorado Springs. And then he said, there are three major areas that will go beyond that. The, the, the third stage is, is media and television ministry. The fourth stage, which we're in right now, has more to do with pastors and churches. And we're he helping pastors and churches, and that's gonna really increase in the future, but we're helping pastors and churches and we continue to help pastors and churches in, in a lot of different ways and, and actually in a lot of different places. And the fifth stage, I'm not gonna tell you about today. Amen, that's yet to be revealed. I know what it is, but it's yet to be revealed. So, but, but God knows the end from the beginning. And as you walk with him in your relationship with the Holy Spirit, I believe that you can fulfill God's plan and purpose. You can fulfill your God-given destiny. And so today I'm gonna to talk about a person. I'm gonna talk about Joseph. And Joseph at a very young age when he was 17 years old dreamed a dream of destiny. And when I went to Andrew's Bible study when I was just 14 years old, 45 years ago, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I knew this is what I'm gonna spend my life doing. And I began to see certain aspects of what I would do, some that took over 25 years for me to begin to walk in. Amen? Amen. But as you walk with Jesus, you know, and the Holy Spirit, he will reveal those things to you. But many times, after God gives you a dream, there will be things that will come and try to kill your dream. They'll try to stop your dream. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about avoiding dream killers. Avoiding dream killers. You know, you're in a great atmosphere right now. The spirit's moving, the worship's awesome, the people are awesome. You know, you're being encouraged in a lot of areas but you've got to avoid dream killers. In fact, my text is 
Genesis chapter 37, I believe it is. In Genesis 37, verse 19, this was Joseph's brothers. They said one to another, behold, this dreamer comes. How many of you know that some people aren't nearly excited about your dream as you are? Now, Joseph was just 17 years old when God give, gave him a dream. And you know what? He probably didn't have a, you know, I mean, he's 17 years old. That he didn't have as much wisdom as maybe he should have. How many of you know some people got more anointing than wisdom? Uh, Pastor Lawson is one of those. <laughs> In fact, I was in this big meeting, you know, kind of a different circle of people. And I mean, there were over 2,500 ministers there of the gospel. And, and so the, the guy preaching, he said, and he was the head guy of that ministry. And, and he said, the number one reason that people come to church is because the pastor is passionate. <laughs> and I said, God, please don't give me any more passion. <laughs> And I told that to Pastor Max Cornell, who came here to Bible school for three years and then, you know, worked for me for three years. And then we helped him plant a church in Kansas City. And he's doing a fantastic job. Karis Church in Kansas City, Kansas, in the west part of Kansas City. Max is doing a phenomenal job. We helped him buy a building, praise God, and got a great deal. And we've helped several people. We helped Brian Clark in Greenville, South Carolina, buy a church. They're doing a great job. Brian and Ashley came to our church for a few years. And, amen, but we're helping. We, we built two churches in India last year. And, and I said, you know, spirit-filled, good churches. And I said on one Sunday, I said, you know, I believe God that we're going to be able to do five this year. And so Monday morning, we work with a ministry. And I called, this, I called this man that does this ministry. He's been doing it for 20 years. I said, hey, you know, we want to we wanna build five churches this year and I'd like to send you the check today to build the first one. You know what? And they work with people in churches in India and they, they have, actually their people have to tithe and give at least half of the money. And then this ministry partners with them and they get the, get the church built. And so I told him and he said, that's, that's really great, Lawson. He said, because yesterday and I, I preached at two different churches and I've got two churches right now that, that are ready. They have their money raised. They're ready to, they need the money to build church. And, and so, and he said, and I went to two churches and spoke yesterday and they both gave money for water wells, but not for churches. And I got two churches ready. I said, well, I'll just double that. I'll, I'll just give the money for the two churches today. And then uh, I got off the phone and I thought about one partner I had. I thought, you know, they might like to build some churches. I'll just give them a call. So, I gave them a call and they said, well, we'll call you back in a little bit. And, and they called me back and they said, pastor, we're good for two. So I was running around the house and shouting and glorifying God. I thought, man, you better watch what you say. It might come to pass <laughs> because I was planning on doing one that day and we already had four spoken for. And then I came and, and Barbara said, what are you rejoicing? What are you shouting about? I said, man, I said, I called in to pay for one church in India today and we paid for four already. <laughs> Glory to God. I told him, I'll mail you the check for two and as soon as I get the other one, I'll mail that. And then Wednesday night, I went to church and those folks were there and they said, hey, we want to do the other three. So we'll just give the money for three. Praise God. So, but we're helping people all over the world and we're helping churches all over the world and God is helping us so that we can help people and I, I love to see the gospel go forward. Amen. And I'm excited, but you know what? You have, to, you have to watch who you share your dream with. You even have to watch who you're passionate with. Some people, times people don't understand my passion. And I get a little passionate sometimes. Amen? But Joseph said, you know, he had a dream and he told his brothers this dream and his father and mother, he said, I was out in the field and I was, I was you know, we were gathering, we were making these shocks of, Stuff and yours all came down. I, I saw these when I was a kid. And, and they bowed to mine. His brothers didn't like that very much. You know? And then he had another dream and he said, I saw 
11 stars, his brothers, and they came and bowed to me in the sun and the moon. And he, he told them these dreams. And so, you know, he was one of the younger brothers and, and they were really upset about it. In fact, it says this in verse 11, after he told him these dreams, Genesis 37, verse 11, his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now, dream killer number one is you've got to watch out for people who don't have their own dreams. Because people who don't have their own dreams will either try to steal yours or kill yours. How many of you know the devil comes to steal, to kill and destroy? And people who are not dreaming their own dreams will come because they're jealous or they're envious and they will try to kill your dream. In fact, it says this in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 18, Pilate knew for envy that they delivered Jesus. One reason the Jews had Jesus crucified was because Jesus began to draw bigger crowds than they did and they were envious of, the, of what he was doing. So you gotta watch out for people that are not dreaming their own dreams because people who aren't dreaming their own dreams will either come try to steal your dream or kill your dream. And so his brothers were out taking care of the flocks and his father said, hey, Joseph, I want you to go take them some food, so on and so forth. And, and, and so he went out there and they said, hey, here comes that dreamer. We're going to do something about in that pretty coat and we're going to do something. And I like to teach on Joseph in favor. He had tremendous favor. He had favor with his father, right? And his father gave him a coat and his brothers took it away. And they said, we're going to take his coat and we're going, to, we're going to tell our father that somebody's killed him. And Reuben, the oldest brother, he said, well, let, let's, let's, you know, throw him in a pit. He thought he'd take him back to his dad. One day Reuben was gone somewhere and, and, and the brothers saw their Midianite cousins come and they said, hey, let's sell him. Who cares about killing him? Let's just sell him. You know, let's make some money. And they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Joseph is a type of Christ. Jesus was sold for the price of a slave, right? These guys had to make some money on him. So, right, they sold him for 20. They probably got at least 30. He was a good strapping young man. But Joseph was sold. You know, Joseph had a dream that came from God. He dreamed a dream of divine destiny. And for 13 years after he dreamed his dream, his Looked like all hell was breaking loose. I mean, he had all kinds of problems, all kinds of trouble, all kind of difficulty. And may I submit to you that sometimes the difficulty that you're facing is not because of the devil. Sometimes the difficulty that you're facing, right, is because God's given you a dream and the devil doesn't want you to fulfill it. And he wants to see if he can kill your dream or steal your dream. So you gotta watch out for people who don't dream their own dreams. Now, they, they took Joseph and it says they sold him for 20 pieces of silver in verse 28 and they took Joseph into Egypt. His brothers brought Joseph's coat and they killed a kid of the goats, dipped the coat in blood and they sent the coat of many colors, this coat of human sentiment, this coat of his father's favor and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found now, is this your son's coat or not? And he said, this is my son's coat. And evil beasts has devoured him and Joseph is doubt torn in pieces. And Jacob ran his clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. And his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, I will go down in the grave. And in my son mourning, his father wept for him. But the Midianites in verse 36 sold Joseph into Egypt under Potiphar and office. A, a, a officer of Pharaoh's and a captain of the guard. Now, in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph got sold. It says this in Genesis 39, verse 1. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, to Potiphar. An officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. Now get this, Joseph probably didn't have any more than a loincloth. He was a slave.
But it says the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. Prosperity is not just what you have on the outside. Prosperity is about what you have on the inside. And if you're born again, you're blessed. You might need to notify your brain. Amen. You might need to notify some other things, but if you're born again, you're blessed. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and the master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight. He found favor in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer of his whole house and all that he had, he put into his hand and it came to pass from time to time, he made him overseer of his house. As Joseph grew in relationship with his master, the master made Joseph the overseer of the whole house and the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house I believe God will bless other people for your sake. For Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. The blessing of the Lord was on everything that he did. Everywhere that he went, everything that he did was blessed. It was noticed, this is a blessed man. Hallelujah. You know, Lawson Purdue is a blessed man. I heard the word and when I, listen, I grew up in a trailer house. My dad struggled with epilepsy. My mom was a school teacher. They struggled with poverty. They drove cars with hundreds of thousands of miles. They struggled with all kinds of problems. In fact, when we went to Andrew's Bible study, my mama was talking about divorcing my dad, which I told her as a young child not to do. But when we went to that Bible study, it turned everything in our family around. And I began to get a vision to prosper. In fact, I told my dad not long after I started going to that Bible study, by the time I'm 25, I'll have a Mercedes. Well, I didn't have a Mercedes when I was 25, but I could have had one. In fact, I had Bob Indian preaching to my church a few years ago, and he said, how many have exactly the car of your dreams? And I raised my hand. She says, what's, your, what's a car? I got a Toyota 4Runner. I love it. <laughs> and you know me, I get a great deal. <laughs> Only Gentiles pay full price. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm blessed by the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in my body. I'm blessed in my mind. I'm blessed in my spirit. I'm blessed in my bank account. I'm blessed in my family. I'm blessed in my church. Everything I touch prospers because God is with me. In fact, there's no way you can explain the blessing of God in my life. I can't explain it. In fact, I was going to Dr. Summerall's Bible school because Andrew didn't have one. In 1987 and 1988, in February of 1988, they had a man come and talk on finances. Lester Summerall had a church of about 2,500 to 3,000 people and and this man came and spoke at the church on Sunday morning, about 3,000 people there. And, and he said, how many people in here are believing for a million dollars? Stand up. And I stood up. I was working for Lester Sumrall in the day and I was going to school at night. I volunteered on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. I worked all the time. And I, stu I was making minimum wage at that time, $4 or four, between $4 and $4.25 an hour. But I stood up, me and two other people. Now, 1988, a million dollars was worth a lot more than a million dollars is right now. <laughs> but I stood up and two other people. And I thought, how pathetic is this? We want to change the world and there's 3,000 people here and only one out of a thousand stands up. Now, I don't know where the other people are, but I started believing that I could be a millionaire by the time I was 40. I didn't hit it by the time I was 40. I hit it by the time I was 45. When I hit it, I wrote my, I, I called all my sons and told them that I'm gonna believe God to give you each a million dollars. 
you'll all get a million dollars in your inheritance. And Andy, my middle son, he's a multimillionaire, he's 34. He said, Daddy, don't believe for a million, believe for three million, believe for 30 million, and don't give it to us, we won't need it. Give it to the grandkids. <laughs> no wonder he's a multimillionaire the way he thinks. In fact, I told him when he graduated from high school, he's very smart, he never had a B in his life. They came and interviewed him on television, Colorado Springs. They said, you ever have a B? He said, no, I never had a B. I said, Andrew, Jesus made you smart, remember that. He said, I will, Daddy. Hallelujah. So he graduated Colorado School of Mines, chemical engineering, outstanding student. In three years, it takes most people five to get their BA. Never had a B. He took this chemical engineering, chemi organic chemistry test. That's the one the doctors do that separates the men from the boys. It was, a nat it was a national test. They did a nationwide test. He had the highest grade in the nation. He tested out of their highest level of math. They've only had five students in the history of their school do that. He got his master's in four years. Takes most people seven there to get a master's. And he graduated again as the outstanding chemical engineering student. Jesus made the kid smart. And he's a tither and a giver. And he's blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know what? The Bible, the Word of God will work for anybody if you'll believe it. The principles that I wrote in that book, provision, releasing supernatural in increase in your life, they'll work for anybody, anybody, if you'll believe it. In fact, I told Barbara just the other day. You see, I left about a million dollar inheritance on the table when I made the decision to go into ministry because my grandparents said, we'll give you this ranch and the livestock and the stuff is worth over a million. One condition, you have to run it. I said, I can't do that because I've got to obey God. So I made that decision right when I was about 15 or 16 years old. But I, I told Barbara the other day, right? And I personally keep my ministry income fairly low. I said, baby, a hundred million is a possibility. <laughs> That's a hundredfold, like Mark says. I said, it's a possibility. I just see it. See, you gotta see it before you can receive it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know, I was in, in 1998. I got 14 minutes. I'm only in point number two. I could better hurry up. In 1998, I was in a meeting in, in Billy Epperhart's church in Littleton, Colorado. And Mark Hankins was preaching. And Mark made me really mad, talking about money. Hallelujah. And now Mark's on my board and I have Mark come preach at my church every year. Hallelujah. And I have Jesse Duplantis come every year. Just make all those religious poverty demons mad. I hate poverty. I hate poverty like I hate sin because it comes from the same place. I hate sickness like I hate sin because it comes from the same place. I hate, you understand me, I H-A-T-E exclamation point, hate poverty and I hate sickness and I hate sin because it comes from the devil. And I hate the devil and I love God and I love Jesus Christ. The Lord was with Joseph and the Lord blessed the hand of Joseph and made everything that Joseph touched to prosper. And everything that Joseph touched was blessed in the house and in the field and he left, Potiphar left everything in Joseph's hand and he didn't know what he had except the bread which he did eat and Joseph was a good person and well Favor. Joseph had the favor of God. The, we got the favor of God on our life. He was full of favor. Favor surrounded him. He was blessed by favor. He was protected by favor. But I want to talk to you about the number two dream killer. The number two dream killer is good, but not God. It's distraction. 
And if the devil can't get you bad, he'll try to get you busy. He'll try to get you distracted. He'll try to get you doing something else other than God's dream. You see, because I believe that Joseph was in Potiphar's house and as he worked and he prospered. You know, the Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3. It says a dream comes from the multitude of business. And I'm telling you how to make a million dollars. And I, listen, I believe about every believer can make a million. I don't believe it's that hard. Hallelujah. I believe I'm anointed to bring blessing and prosperity to the body of Christ. Amen. Just figure out how to make a thousand and do it a thousand times. You got a million. A million's only a thousand thousand. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not that much money in today's time. Hallelujah. We have a church building that's worth, the tax valuation is $22 million. And it's completely paid for. And we're getting ready for the next opportunity that God gives us. And if I'm correct, in the future, God will give Kira's Christian Center an amazing opportunity. Hallelujah. If I am correct. And I believe that I am. And people in the world will look and they will marvel at what Jesus Christ does for us. Hallelujah. God blesses you to make you a blessing. He told Abraham, I'll make your name great. Hallelujah. And I'll bless the families of the earth through you. It's not about you. It's about the people that he wants to bless through you. Kit Carson wasn't about me. It was about people like Carrie Pickett that God raised up in Kit Carson. And everywhere I've been that God has raised up people and God has sent forth people. And I'm still in, you know what true success is? True success is what you invest in other people. It's really not about you. It's about who you raise up. And if I'm a successful pastor, I'll impart success success to my people. If I'm a successful husband, I'll impart success to my wife. If I'm a successful father, I'll impart success to my children. If I'm a successful Bible school teacher, I'll impart success to the students at this Bible school. It's really not about me. See, I was at Kit Carson and I was working and God was with me and I was prospering. And Andrew Womack came and, and I began to think, I got my house paid off. I got my car paid off. I got my little feedlot paid off. Now all I got to do is have my, 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 you know, raise some money so my kids can go to college and have a retirement. And Andrew came and said, some of you are thinking like this. He rang my bell. I got my house paid off. I got my car paid off. I got my business paid off. Read my mail. And so I had to move to Colorado Springs to start a new church with almost no people and no money. And I left everything back there. And I came and I had 50% down to put on a house and I had to go to six banks before I found a banker that would loan me the money. In fact, the first banker we went to, the, the realtor, she got a little upset. She showed us, she said, you gotta go talk to my banker. So she took us to her banker. We sat across the desk, her little... Banker sat across the desk. Those weren't swear words. <laughs> but I don't want to be deriding to people. So she sat across the desk and said, she looked at my 1040s. And she said, well, you can't even afford to buy a lot in this school district, let alone a house. And I kind of sat up in my chair. Barbara said, I turned beet red. I embarrassed her. And I said, if I couldn't do it, I wouldn't be here. And I walked out the door. Now listen, I wasn't trying to embarrass my wife. But you see, she was looking at the natural situation. She was looking at what the government said at my 1040s. But she was not looking at the dream on the inside of me. And she was not looking at the, my spiritual DNA. Besides that, I had a word from God from Cecil Paxton. And the man's given me several, him and his wife, Lisa, and they have never missed it. Andrew's given me about 22 words of wisdom in the last 45 years, and 20 of them have come to pass. And I'm believing the other two are coming to pass too. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're seeing evidence of it. Woo, glory. I got seven minutes and three points. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Say grace. 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 But see, if the devil can't make you bad, he wants to get you busy, he wants to get you distracted, doing something else other than what God called you, appointed you, anointed you to do. But you need to be about the Lord's business. You need to be doing exactly what Jesus wants you to do. 
nothing more and nothing less. Just do what Jesus wants you to do, period. Verse seven, it came to pass after these things, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me, but he refused and said, my master doesn't even know what he has in the house and he's committed everything into my hand and there's none greater in this house than I neither because you're his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Dream killer number three, sin. We don't talk about sin a lot in gray circles, but we might need to talk about it a little bit more. Because listen, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is expensive. Sin is stupid. Sin is emotional. And sin is two things. Number one, and we'll, we'll talk about three. Number one, sin is a transgression of God's law. Number two, sin, right, the Bible says this in James chapter four, verse 17, to him that knows to do good and does it not to that man, it's sin. We need something called in the body of Christ called integrity. And we've got a huge lack of integrity in the body of Christ. And we have people doing things and violating everything about moral and spiritual and ethical integrity and thinking that God's gonna bless them. You may think nobody knows and nobody hears, but God knows and God hears, and you ought to get a brain. <laughs> How can I do this great sin is really missing the mark. How can I do this great evil and sin against God? It's about a relationship with God. Listen, I try to obey God. I believe one reason that I'm so blessed I believe one reason Karis Christian Center is so blessed is because I really, really, really try to obey God in the realm of giving and receiving. Amen. Came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day. This is this wicked woman. He hearkened not to lie by her or be with her, but it came to pass about this time Joseph went into his house to do business and there was none of the men of the house within and she caught him by his garment saying lie with me and he left his garment in her hand and got it run baby run <laughs> i love something jesse duplantis says embarrass sin before it embarrasses you he had a hooker got on an elevator with him and he ran her out of the elevator saying whore of babylon Man, you do whatever it takes, but don't go there. <laughs> Listen, I've had Bible school girls hit on me. Andrew asked me years ago, do you think about this, about this girl? I said, I don't know, but she hit on me. <laughs> he said, that's enough for me. She's out. Sin will embarrass you. Embarrass sin. You know, there's four reasons in Romans 6 that we, we should live above sin. We're dead to it, we're free from it, we have authority over it, and it'll kill you. Sin, don't go there. Some places you don't need to go, some things you don't need to do. Now, prejudice, right? Got him in, <laughs> husband came home. Now, listen, he knew his wife was a little screwy. <laughs> but to save embarrassment... He had Joseph thrown in prison. And Joseph, Joseph, yes, look, we read the end of the chapter. In, in verse 22, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed everything to Joseph's hand, all the prisoners, and whatever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not at anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Listen, God was with him. God was with him and his daddy gave him a coat. And his brothers took it away and his boss wife gave him a coat. And his, you know, his boss gave him a coat and his boss wife took it away. And the pre prison keeper gave him a coat. And, and you know, Joseph prospered where he was. He was in the prison and God promoted him and, and he took care of everything in the prison. And then they threw the, 
the, the Pharaoh's butler and baker in the prison. And, and, and Joseph was there. And one day, it, it was amazing in Joseph's prison because everybody was happy there. Let me tell you the next dream killer. Discouragement. Most people, when they're in prison, they say, why did I get here? I didn't deserve this. You know what they did? Paul and Silas in Acts 16 prayed and sang praises to God when they cast them into prison and beaten them for preaching the gospel of Jesus. What would you do? I don't deserve this. Discouragement is a dream killer. And Joseph said, hey, guys, what's the problem? Well, we, we dreamed a dream. He said, hey, that's no problem. Doesn't God interpret dreams? And he, he told them the interpretation. And it came to pass. And he said, now, you remember me. But it says when we go on down here, in verse 23, the chief butler did not remember Joseph but forgot him. Dude, there's some people forget you, but God has not forgotten him. And the last dream killer... Joseph was in that prison for two more years. And the Pharaoh had a dream, and Joseph interpreted the dream. The last dream killer that I'm going to talk about, there are more, but the last one I'm going to talk about today is delay. And I want to tell you today that delay is not denial. And may, you may think the dream has passed. You may think it's too late. You may think it's over. But delay is not denial. And when Pharaoh was upset, the butler said, what's, what's the trouble? He said, I had a dream. He said, oh, I remember my evil. There's a little Hebrew boy down there in the prison. And he interpreted our dreams and it came to pass just like he said. And when Joseph got out, he shaved himself and he got ready to go in the presence of Pharaoh. You know, his daddy gave him his coat and his brothers took it away. And his boss gave him a coat and his wife's boss took it away. And the prison keeper gave him a coat, but he took that one off and he shaved himself and he got prepared to go into the presence of the Pharaoh. And Joseph, by the direction of the Spirit of God, made Pharaoh the richest man on the planet. When that prison gave, keeper gave him that coat, Joseph took that one off. And after he took that one off, Pharaoh gave him a coat. It was a coat of divine destiny. And he wore that coat for the rest of his life. And his dream came to pass 22 years later. His dream came to pass. So I'm going to end with what I started. Do you have a dream? Do you have a dream? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask two things. Number one, if you're here and you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, because if you haven't been, if, if I wouldn't be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'd be in Southeast Colorado farming and feeding cows. But listen, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, I want to invite you to come up here. I've asked Mark. Hallelujah. Mark came to my church and got saved when I was preaching on grace. Amen. Then he started working here and became a prayer minister and a Bible school night director. <laughs> Man, it's amazing what the Holy Ghost will do for you, Mark. I asked Mark to have people up here, but if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues, you need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. If you're not born again, you need to do that first. And secondly, I'm gonna ask this. If you're here and you're in this place and you're struggling with cancer, I want you to come up here and let me personally lay hands on you, okay? And I'm gonna believe God. We've seen lots of people healed from cancer. I'm going to believe God with you. Not all of them, but lots of them. I'm going to believe God with you that Jesus Christ will heal you. God bless you. We love you. Thank you. you can, Andrew, do what you need to do. Hallelujah. So Mark, get your prayer team. We just need to pray that this man gets a little passion. 
Love you, brother. I love so, you too. If you need any of those things he was mentioning about, please come down here. We're going to take a break until 1020. Is that right? Okay, so we've got uh, a while here. So anyway, we've got all of the things open. Our cafes are open. If you need prayer for the baptism or if you want Pastor Lawson to come lay hands on you, please come down here. We'll be back at 1020 for Barry Bennett. You guys are back and I, buckle your seatbelts because the next session is about to start and it's going to be an awesome speaker. Oh, so please stay yes. connected. Yeah. So. We're going to close those doors. If you don't make it in 30 seconds, you lose out, people. Students, I know you know the campus, but please help our audience or the uh, guests to find their way back to the auditorium. Thank you. We appreciate your help. There we go. Everybody's running back in here. This is good. Hey, it's worth running for. Hey, this, I'm ready for the next session. Oh, yes. This has been good. Will you get to conference? Are we buying it? We should. We should, definitely. We can fast forward over ourselves, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what we usually do. But it's all good. Okay. All Are right. we ready? Let, we're just yes. ready. Let's just get started because we want to give our speaker as much time as possible. Let's do that. Amen. Okay? Amen. Guys, can you please help us welcome our founder and president again, Andrew Womack. Praise the Lord. Well, it's been awesome. We're down to our last speaker, and then Carrie and I are going to be up here uh, just kind of summarizing and taking questions and things. But man, it's been an awesome time, and hopefully, uh, you've borne witness with that. And we'd love to have you come and be a part of this because God's changing people's lives. So now we've got Barry Bennett up. His claim to fame is that he's Daniel Bennett's dad. I've got two grand nieces that go to school here and they, they say that Daniel is their favorite speaker. Used to, Barry was always everybody's favorite speaker, but I think that Daniel has risen to the top. And we are so blessed to have Barry with us. Barry fought for his life and nearly lost him, but man, he's back and he is passionate about the Lord and and Barry's fluent in Spanish. They ministered in Chile, and he's just been an awesome, awesome blessing. So let's welcome uh, Barry Bennett as he comes to minister. Come here, brother. Amen. 
Thank you so much. Praise God. It is awesome to be here. As I now say, it's awesome to be anywhere. <laughs> but it's especially special to be here. And uh, I always enjoy sharing at campus days and getting to, to meet a lot of you and share the word with you. And uh, looking forward to this time. I have, we have, uh, what do you know, books. So uh, this is the one that got me healed, the one I wrote, called He Healed Them All, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> including me. And uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a great book. All these books are out there somewhere on the book tables or in the bookstore. This is the first book I wrote, Did God Do This to Me? This is more of a question and answer book. Uh, it started with the former director of the school. He asked me to do some frequently asked questions for the website. So I said, sure. And then he got inspired. He says, this should be a pamphlet. Can you make it bigger? I said, okay. So I started working on a longer version. And then he finally says, you know what? I think this should be a book. And I said, okay. <laughs> so it wouldn't have been the first, my first choice for a book. But anyway, it's got some interesting questions and hopefully some answers in there. And then uh, Hearing God is uh, what I was going to speak on today, but I, I've changed. Uh, time has flown uh, but this is a great book. A lot of my experiences in here about uh, how to hear God and how God can lead you and guide you and direct you and warn you. Uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff. My latest book, Shaping Your Future, is on the power of the seed and how you can, you have influence over your future, whether you know it or not. In fact, your future, what you're living right now, you have created in many, in many senses of the word. And so we have great influence over our future. Is Matt near? Okay, I'll let you discern who needs those. Okay, amen. Praise God. So I've been uh, enjoying this week, for me, seeing certain people up on the stage. It's uh, triggered memories, kind of a trip down memory lane. Uh, Mike and Carrie, when they were up speaking, I, th you know, I was remembering my time with them in Russia. I got to spend a week with them in Russia and minister, and uh, they had me speaking about uh, 14 hours a day, and, uh, <laughs> or maybe it was more, I forget. Uh, anyway, but it was, a, it was a blessing. And then uh, when Ashley and Carly were up here, I, I don't think they're here today, but uh, my first year when I moved from uh, AWM over to Karis, uh, I was put in charge of the, I was the first third year coordinator when third year was one group didn't have all of the fancy stuff we have now. Uh, and Ashley and Carly were my assistants. And so uh, to see what God has done with them, and uh, I didn't never understand a word they said, but uh, <laughs> you know, we had a lot of hand signals. And, uh, but uh, they did real good, and they're, they're, uh, they, now I have a ministry all over the world, that's, that's awesome. And then I saw Daniel up here. And, uh, I can remember when he used to be my son. He, uh, he, uh, he now thinks he's my boss. Uh, uh, I let him think that, it's okay. I'm very secure in who I am. <laughs> but, uh, Oh, that's a blessing, and Pastor Lawson is such a blessing, and uh, during my healing journey, he was uh, uh, calling me very frequently, praying for me, and uh, just a real blessing in my life, and everyone that's been up here, obviously, Andrew, Andrew, thank you for this. Praise God. We, we are so blessed. You are sitting in the middle of a miracle. And if you can't tell, we like it here. This is, and you would too if you'd come to school. Amen. This is such a blessing. Praise God. All right, so my message has evolved over the week as different speakers have stolen my stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but I finally just said the heck with it. This is what I'm going to preach. So... Uh, Praise God. I believe you'll get blessed. But let's, go, let's start in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians something. I forgot to put the chapter here. <laughs> I know the verses, 14 through 16, but uh, be led by the Spirit and you can find this. It says, uh, 
See, I was making adjustments this morning and I, got, I forgot the chapter. Anyway, <clears throat> I've got the verse. Now, thanks, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that didn't work. Okay. <laughs> Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma of death leading to death and to the other an aroma of life leading to life. I want to talk about smells. You think I'm kidding. (laughs) I want to talk about the aroma of life versus the stench of death. And I want to help us distinguish uh, between those smells. Amen. I remember once uh, when I was in Boy Scouts, I went to a, we lived in Southern California and I went to a summer camp up in the mountains somewhere in Southern California. And uh, did a week of whatever Boy Scouts do, you know, all the camping merit badges, all the running around and, and the campfires and cooking and all of this stuff. So after a week, my parents drove up to get me. And uh, I got in the car and within, two, within a minute, they both said, Barry, my goodness, you stink. <laughs> what in the world, didn't you bathe the whole week? And I said, well, no, I didn't need to. I, <laughs> I don't smell anything. I mean, I, th- think, I think it's great. What's up? They say, no, man, you smell, you stink. And I thought, well, you know, thanks a lot. But I didn't know I smelled because I had become used to it. But they knew I smelled because they weren't of that environment. I, we went camping once, this is many years later, I was probably uh, 18, 19, we went on a, a church camp while I was in college and went camping out. And one guy wandered off in the woods at night <laughs> and all of a sudden we hear this yell, this scream, this guy, and then we hear the foot pounding, you know, running back toward camp. And what happened? What happened? He got sprayed by a skunk. <laughs> it's down in Texas. And uh, of course, he was not allowed in his tent and had to sleep on a a cement uh, picnic table all by himself, several campgrounds away. (laughs) Of course, he knew he stunk, but uh, so did everybody within about a mile. That was powerful, but a good illustration. Uh, Sometimes you stink and you don't know it, but everybody around you knows it. Because there are certain, we'll call it aromas, there are, there are signs of where you are in your Christian life. And you know when Adam and Eve sinned, God spoke to them and said, don't eat of this tree. When you do, you shall surely die. Well, what happens when something dies? It starts to rot, it starts to stink. And when they unleashed death in the world, that we are still dealing with the ramifications of that decision. And there is death all around us in our society. There is death, in, when, you, <clears throat> when you see people, I mean, I, I, I talk to people all the time, I run into people, and I'm not in, not in a form of judging, but you can see what sin has done to people. You can see it in their eyes, you can see it in their personalities, you can see it in their, their fear or their arrogance, you can see all kinds of signs of what sin has done. And I'm not necessarily saying their own sin, but just the sin that permeates the world in which we live. You can look in Washington, <clears throat> it stinketh. Yeah. <laughs> it's full of death. Excuse my throat, I can't turn this off because they've got me automatically on, but anyway, if I have to clear my throat, please forgive me. But you, you, look, you look, I mean, no one up there seems to be capable of telling the truth. I used, when I was a kid, I would look at, uh, you know, I'd see the news if my parents were watching or whatever, and I would see these politicians, and I would think, these are the smartest people in the world. And these are the people that are at the cream of the crop. 
These are the people that have made it to the top. These are people we need to listen to. That's as a six-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old. Uh, today, I look at the people we have in Washington. This is the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> These people have no business having a say over anything. <clears throat> and I'm gonna say this a number of times, but they stink. There is an aroma of death, a stench of death from people that lie, people that are incredibly immoral, people that are stealing your money, people that are looking for any way to scam you. That's a, there's a stench of death. If you look into the entertainment world, the entertainment world stinketh to high heaven. It is, it is a stench of immorality beyond that which we have ever seen before. It used to be there, but it was hidden. My wife sometimes reads books about old time movie stars and she finds out they were just like modern movie stars. It was just hidden. It was the same stench. But we have that and we, we pipe that, as Andrew said, we pipe that into our homes and we, let, we pay to have them stink up our homes with that filth. That's the stench of death. When, when God told Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. There is something that has taken place in the world over the last several thousand years that is getting worse and worse and worse. And when people say, Barry, don't you think things are getting better? No, I don't. Technology does not mean things are getting better. The morality is getting worse. And I see what sin has done to people. I see how they, their lives have become twisted and they don't even know it. But if you are walking in the aroma of Christ, you can sense the aroma of death, the stench of death. You can see what sin has done in people's lives. We can see, I mean, my goodness, had anyone ever dreamed of what is happening to our children today, what they're being exposed to and what people are fighting for the right to do to have drag queens read them stories? What on earth, what kind of insanity is this? Insanity is a stench of death. These people are nuts, these people are crazy and we're sending our kids to those schools. And now they want to give them drugs and change their, their, their makeup, so to speak, and, and, and surgery and all of this on kids because they had a bad day and felt like something's different so I must be different. Well, let's, let's chop this off and do this and give you some drugs. What, what are people thinking? This, this is a stench of death all around us. And then we bring it into the church. <clears throat> and we, we begin to make excuses for the death that is, that is around us. And, and it really, what really pushes my buttons are those that make theology to accommodate it. And churches now are debating whether or not they should have gay marriages and gay priests and gay pastors and gay this and gay that. And I'm thinking, I smell it. Why don't you smell it? What happened to your sense of, of spiritual smell? This is the stench of death. This is, this is incredible. And then we get to do theologies that accommodate defeat. And we have theologies that, well, you know, God is in control. That's death, it stinks. We have theologies about, well, whatever will be, will be. We have theologies that say, you know, God does whatever he wants and we just have to suck it up and, and sickness is okay. Sickness is sent to teach you something. That stinks. That stinks. And people that criticize those that are prosperous, those that are, God is blessing them. What, what should the blessing of God look like? And we have people that say, well, he shouldn't have an airplane. Why do you care? Why do you care? And let's come up with the theology. We're against prosperity gospel. I'm thinking, if you're against the prosperity gospel, you're against the gospel. Because it's, it's all about increase. God is all about life. He's all about increase. He's all about blessing. And all we see in many churches, they say, well, signs and wonders have passed away and miracles have passed away. In your church, yeah, but not here. That stinks. 
When people start telling me what God will and will not do, what God can and cannot do, what God quit doing, when did he quit doing? Give me the date. I want the date. When did he quit doing it? When did he quit? He, he, he heals your baby one day, but he won't heal a baby the next day because that, that passed away overnight. That stinks. This is the aroma of death and we've let it creep into the church to where we're accommodating death, we're accommodating poverty, we're accommodating sickness, God sent that to teach you something. Well, we don't know what, but something, you should learn something. No, but that's, when, when we create those theologies, we are accommodating the death that began with Adam and Eve. When they unleashed death, they unleashed corruption, they unleashed the stench, the aroma of death unto death. And when the church says, yeah, come on in, we'll, we'll make room for that. That's wrong, folks, that's wrong. We are living in a society that is twisted, that's perverted, that's contaminated, it's cancerous. I mean, we could, look, we could think of sin, and I'm not talking about individual sins, I'm talking about the spectrum of death in the earth, sin in the earth. Your sins may add to this problem, but I'm just talking about sin in general. It's like a cancer. It's like a cancer that we've put up with for too long. It says in Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah 5.20 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. You know, I really, I, I, I've been hearing we've been in the last days since I got born again in 1972 and everything was about the last days then. And then in the 80s, Jimmy Carter became president and then for sure Jesus is coming back. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we had freeze dried food, we were storing up. I mean, it was the end. And uh, we went through, some of you in my era know what I'm talking about. Uh, then, you know, things have, have transpired and gone on and on. And I don't know if we're in the last of the last days, but I tell you one thing that really stands out to me. When we start doing to children what we're doing, I can't see this lasting much longer. It would be better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you'd be cast into the sea. That's Jesus said that, amen? And when we start mutilating kids and exposing them to sexual perversion in kindergarten and, and on up, what in the world? That is the stench of death. And it says, those who call evil good and good evil, woe to them who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're in the middle of that right now. We are in the middle of, of one of the darkest times or the darkest time probably in history and it's only getting darker. And I had a pastor write me once and said, don't you think things are getting better? I think things are getting better. I think we're gonna... <laughs> I don't even want to keep speaking about that. Then. <laughs> it's incredible how sin has entered into even the genetic makeup. Your genes don't define you, but in the sense that you don't have to do what your genes say. Your genes have to do what you say. You can change your makeup. What you give yourself to, you become a slave of. And that can change even to the point of your, your DNA. Things can change because we become slaves to that which we bow the knee to. And the stench of death begins to take over and you don't know it. Because when you're the one that's been at scout camp for a week and you get in the car, you think you smell like pine trees but you don't. <laughs> and when we're around people, and I'm not saying this to judge or criticize, I'm saying this to make us aware, people smell us. And are they smelling life? Are they smelling the joy of the Lord? Are they smelling peace that passes understanding? Or are they smelling death and fear and worry and all of these other, other things, immorality and perversion? What are they getting, what's your, What's your drift? What are you putting out? 
what is permeating your environment. How many have ever walked into a home and you can tell that the couple that lives there, there's been something going on, there's, there's tension in the air. You can minister to people and you can tell there's something going on that can't look you in the eye. They're, sometimes they're shaking. Sometimes I understand it's a ministry time and we're trying to get people free. I get it. But you can see what sin has done to people. You can see what sin has done to families, tearing them apart. You can see all of these kinds of things everywhere we look. We're living in this, this dark and contaminated world. It's reeking of death. Romans 12, 2, we've it's been hit on several times this week and with, it's important to always be doing this one. It says, and do not be conformed to this world. Question, why not? Do not be conformed to this world. Why would Paul say that? Why not? Because it stinks. It's reeking of death. And even when Christians come traipsing around trying to look like the world to be accepted, trying to do everything the world does, trying to have the same fun as the world has, it stinks. We should look different. We should be different. There should be something different about the body of Christ. How can you be the head and not the tail if you look like the tail? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, that which perhaps you have been conformed to is not the perfect and good and acceptable will of God. Don't be conformed to that anymore. It's dead, it's dying, it stinks. It's contaminating. And even in many churches, it's, it's gotten in. And they're making room for it. They're making theologies to accommodate it. And they don't, it's, people don't care anymore. What if, what if people fell down dead in your church from being exposed for the lies they're telling? That happened in the first church. I don't hear that happening very much anymore. Why? Because they stink. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Dead. Well, that's a different environment. I was talking in class last week, I guess, about this maybe. And, hey, mom, dad, how was church today? It's awesome. Two people got slain in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> For real? Yeah. First John 5, 19. First John 5, 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world that a lot of people want to move up, upward mobility. I want this, I want that. I want to look like the world. I want to, I want to be in the world. It's under the stench of death. Yes. It stinks. There are times when you've run into people that have, uh, this, I don't want to be too graphic, but people have had, we'll say bad breath. I've probably been one of those people. And you, you want to be polite, but you don't want to get too close. Yeah? Or people that have, we'll just we'll say, been working out. Uh, and, and you get close to them and you want to be polite, but oh, you don't want to get too close. I want to be polite. I want the love of God to draw people. But there are some people I just don't want to get too close. In, a, in the sense I'm speaking of here, Sin has created a stench of death in their lives. And they are full with the manifestations. They're full with the symptoms of it. Now, we, in the ministry, we are here for you. But you may not know how much you stink and how hard it is for some of us to be around you. Amen? Because you have chosen to look like the tail. You've chosen to act like the world, you've chosen to accommodate everything that's going on in the world. And it's hard for some of us to understand the difference, to see where, where's the distinction, where's the dividing line? When, at what point did you get born again and the life of God came into, inside of you? Where's the evidence of that? Anybody still with me? Yeah. Yeah.
Romans 8, 2. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of the stink of death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I wanna to talk to you about our redemption and what it means and what it should mean for each of us and in our lives. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There is something called the spirit of life, which is the opposite of what Adam and Eve unleashed when they ate of the wrong tree. They unleashed death. They unleashed everything that accompanies death. Every kind of, of malady, every, every, every kind of human suffering, every, everything that we say, well, <clears throat> why doesn't God do something? We did this. Adam did this. Adam and Eve did this. Jesus came to undo this. It says in, I think it's 1 John 5, 18, I'm thinking, that he came to destroy the works of the devil. I'm not sure I called it right, but anyway. 1 John 3, 8, thank you. I've got so many verses tumbling around up here. He came to destroy the works of the devil when theologies accommodate the works of the devil and say, well, that was God. Well, what, what are the works of the devil? Why are we letting the stink of the devil into our theology and making doctrines to accommodate it? What did he come to destroy? The works of the devil. Well, then there must be a devil. And he must have some works. Amen? And they must be worthy of destruction. And Jesus came to destroy them. Is that right? Amen. So why are we letting it in the church? Why are we making doctrines to make everybody feel good? It stinks. It stinks. Now, I'm not against the people, but I'm against the stink. And we need to be aware. If we're going to set people free, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Well, then we should be starting to smell better. Amen. There should be something inside of us of the excellence of God, the integrity of God, the love of God, the, the purpose of God, the vision, the dream of God. These things should be coming alive within us and the stink of the past should be leaving. Yay. We shouldn't be saying, and this, let's do that and this. Let's, let's make sure we, we, everybody likes us. No, maybe it's age, I don't know, but I don't care if anybody likes me. I hear people say that all the time. Well, I'm, I'm old enough now to say what I think, you know. Well, maybe I've gotten there. But I am so focused in on the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that I don't want anything to do with the stink of death. I don't want to have to try and accommodate anybody in that arena. I love you. I want to help you. I want to minister to you. But I don't want to be like you. I got set free from that. As Jesse Duplantis says, what else in the world do you want to do? What else like the world do you want to be? When he, when he runs into Christians that you can't tell that they're Christians. Why do you want to be like the world? Amen. Romans 15, 29, I love this verse. Romans 15, 29 says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He says, when I come to you, I wanna come smelling good. I wanna come with the full blessing. I wanna come with the whole package. I want you to see what Christ can do. I was the chief among sinners. I led people to their deaths. I, I was a mess. But I want, when I come to you, I wanna come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. This is Paul speaking. Why? Because there's something now different about him. Don't you think there was something different about Paul? After he went from being the chief of sinners to being a carrier of the fullness of the blessing. What are you a carrier of? What are you carrying? The, the, the aroma of life or the stench of death? How much death are you willing to accommodate? How much stink, how much stink do you still like in your life? And you may not even smell it, but we do. <laughs> Other people do. We, we, we have so many people that are still being twisted by sin, perverted by sin, 
And some theologies are telling them, it's okay. We love you anyway. Yeah, we love you, but come on, let's get transformed. Let's get the full blessing of the gospel going inside of us. Amen? As Andrew mentioned, I had a, a, a life and death thing three years ago. Actually, it was at this conference that, uh, the day after I sp- spoke at this thing. It was a Zoom or a live stream because of COVID. And the day after that, the, I got the phone call that I was about to die and because of a blood test and tumor and the whole thing. I won't go through the whole story. But having gone through that, I now have a, a, a different perspective on life, on death, and on what gives life, and on what produces death, and on what I see for my, my dream, for me, for my family. Things are just different now. I I'm, I'm perhaps was too tolerant of some things. I can look back now and I can smell some things I didn't smell at the time. I was too tolerant of different things. And now I look back and I think, those things were, they, that stinks. I don't want to stink. When, I, when I'm in ministry, when I'm on the platform, when I'm in class, when, whatever I'm doing, I want people to see life. I want them to see the joy of the Lord. You may not think you see it right now, but <laughs> <laughs> it's in there. But I'm on a mission right now, okay? We'll laugh later. But I want people to see love. I want people to see compassion. I want people to see Jesus in me. And I can't be playing around with the dead stuff of the world and come and bring you Jesus. I can't do it. It stinks. It's the wrong aroma. Galatians, let's talk about our redemption. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I'm gonna go through several things here that Jesus did for us that that need to become rooted into our very core being. That Jesus became a curse for you. He took the stink of sin and death on himself. He became it. So that you didn't have to live there anymore. You can be free from that. We have been freed from the sin of cur- the curse of sin. He became the curse. Yes, sir. I don't have to make theologies to accommodate my, my laziness. I don't want that. I want to be transformed. I want to be completely, fully given over to the good things of God. One of the things that have done more in my life in the last three years is I began studying the goodness of God. And I've said this many times now in class and other places, but that study of God's goodness did more for my faith than studying faith. Because I recognize my source on a deeper level than ever before and how good he is. And it says in Psalms, his paths drip with abundance. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I have hundreds of those kinds of scriptures marked in my Bible. And I go back and I read them over and over because the goodness of God is what gets my faith going. I used to study faith. I still like to teach and study faith, but with a different look at it now. Faith is a symptom. It's not a subject. It's a symptom of your walk with God, of your fellowship with God, of you knowing who he is. Faith smells good. That's a sweet aroma of trusting God. Amen. He is, he became the curse for you in Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of the stink. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. People, now I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm sorry here. But you got to love me, it's biblical. People run around trying to get delivered. What did that verse just say? Do we believe the Bible or not? See, one of the ways to get your smell better is to start believing what the word says. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Why do you keep trying to get delivered? What you need is the truth to set you free. You need to get into the word of God and let the truth set you free. You've been delivered. 
All, everything that was against you got nailed to the cross. And he's, because of that, he spoiled principalities and powers. The only, th the only thing that can be against you is what you allow to be against you. But if you would receive the truth and decide you want to be the head and the, and the tail, not just theologically, but in reality, you want to be the head and not the tail, get a hold of the truth. It will set you free. You have been delivered from the power of darkness. When people try to accommodate and they talk about generational curses, oh, that pushes my, I'm just pushing my own Whoa. buttons here. <laughs> generational curses. Good grief. We had, didn't Jesus just on, we just read he became the curse for us. And we are under what now? Generational blessings. My children are blessed after me. Their children are gonna be even more blessed. I expect this to continue to grow. Blessing after blessing after blessing. I'm not worried about generational curses, good grief. That is a theology of stench, of stink. That's not the Bible. We need, we need to get our, our hearts and our minds in line with what the word of God says. By his stripes, we were healed, not we could be. We were healed. Well, Barry, you had cancer. Yeah, and I'm healed. Yeah. Amen. Why do you think healing exists? Because sicknesses exist. All right. I had a battle. God won. Amen. Amen. But it's because I know that by his stripes, I was healed. I am healed. I don't deal with demons. I've been delivered from the power of darkness where it really, really stinks. Where it's the, the aroma of death all the time, of perversion, of twisted thinking, of di darkness and light, everything reversed. I'm out of that world. I am out of it. Praise God. Second Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is a verse that changed my life back in 19, I always have to stop and think, 1980, when I was not doing well in, in my emotional, mental, spiritual state, and I was lying on the floor of a gov government subsidized apartment, <laughs> uh, counting carpet fibers, uh, <laughs> and moaning and groaning, and the Lord spoke that verse to me. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that came alive. Now I realized, I thought that was a full revelation at the time, but I realized since then that revelations come as seeds many times and they keep producing fruit. They keep growing the fruits of righteousness. And that revelation of righteousness got me on the path to being who, who I am today, whatever that means. But who I used to be is not who I am today because the, the righteousness of God began to produce a different aroma. I got out of the inferiority, I got out of the fear, I got out of the shyness, I got out of the trauma of public speaking. Now I love public speaking. That's only God could do that. Only God could do that. That is a, a sweet smelling savor. That's an aroma of God in me that I can even stand up here and do this. See, God will change you if you'll let him. But he became sin for you. He took that which is wrong with humanity, that which was wrong with the world, that everything that is creating stench and stink and all of the gr gross stuff going on in our culture, the immorality that they're trying to legalize and make moral. All of this stuff that's going on right now, he became that to set you free from it. Quit dabbling in it. Quit accommodating it. Quit saying, well, but they really love each other. No, they don't. They don't, they can't because it's not based on truth. Love is a spiritual thing. Love is not an emotional roller coaster. Love is a spiritual dynamic of God himself. Don't tell me people of the same sex love each other. That's a lie, they've believed a lie. And Christians that say, well, it's okay. That's a lie, it stinks. It's death. Oh, wow. He became sin, that we, we were the tail. I'll let your mind run with that. 
So he became that so that you could become the head. So it's a lot better with the head. Amen. The head has eyes to see. The head can speak. The head can smell. The head can hear God. The tail can't do any of that. The tail has another function. <laughs> he became sin for you so that you could be free to have God live inside of you and that you could emanate the sweet savor of Christ and that you could have the joy of the Lord, that you could have peace, that you could, that you could be a vessel of love. He shed his love abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. God poured himself into each and every one of us. And, and, and how are we treating that? How are we treating that? Man, but I want my friends to like me. Why? They're dead. They stink. How can you help them if you're just like them? What difference can they see in you? Oh, Joe, he's a Christian now, but he still hangs out with us. Well, in what sense does he hang out with you? Is he still doing the same stuff or is he witnessing to you? All right, are y'all are following me here? Amen. He became sin. Well, what happened when you become sin? If he became sin so that we might be, be, be made righteous, then there are some effects to that. It says in Psalm 103, verses three and four, who forgives all your iniquities. How many of you would say, that? yeah, that's me? Okay. About 20 of you. Okay. <laughs> who heals all your diseases. How many would say, that's me? See, when you deal with the root sin, you've dealt with the fruit sickness. It has no more authority. My son, your sins have forgiven you. Take up your pallet and go. If you deal with the root, you've dealt with the fruit. See, this is what's happened is that there is a, that's life. That smells like life. And the Pharisees are sitting there criticizing Jesus. That's death. Criticism. Complaining, oh, complaining and gossip, that's, the, you're working for the accuser of the brethren. Everything, if it's not just exactly the way you want it, you criticize. Come on. I did a message, when was it, last fall in healing school about the words of your heart. I forget what we called it, but it's not always what you say out loud that means anything, it's what you say after you're alone the words of your heart, that's what you really believe. And that's where things happen in your heart. <coughs> Sickness is a part of the curse. I'm starting to get to my punchline here. Sickness is a part of the curse. Say with me, I refuse to be under the curse. The slip. I refuse to be under the curse. I'm not going to stink like that anymore. No, you don't have to say that. We'll be here all day, <laughs> which is not a bad idea. But I refuse to be under the curse. By his stripes, I was healed. I am done with the curse. How many of you are gonna join with me today? I'm done with the curse. I'm done with the stink. I'm done with what sin has done to my life and to my family and with the society. I'm done with it. I'm not gonna smell anymore. I refuse the stench of, of, the, of sin, of the curse. And I don't care if everybody around me can smell me or not smell me. I know that there's a sweet savor of Christ inside of me. And that will eventually become obvious to everyone. Let's do another one. So he became a curse for us. He became sin for us. Let's do this last one here. Not the last of all my scriptures, but for now. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was, uh, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. You ought to hear the doctors of theology freak out over that verse. Well, it can't possibly mean, it does. Look up the words. He left glory. He could have stayed up there, could have left us down here. He emptied himself, he became poor in the relative sense of the word. He wasn't a vagabond, but in, in the relative sense of where he had been 
but he did that. He became poor on the cross so that you could become rich. Well, Barry, do you mean rich, rich? Yes, I mean rich, rich. But go back to what my, my former son said. <laughs> no, he's, he's still my son. I'm super well pleased with him. Amen. Praise God. But that was a tremendous message on the prosperous spirit. Prosperity begins in your spirit. Prosperity begin, it takes over your mind. The renewing of the mind is prosperity. The, the fruit of the spirit is prosperity. The, your, your emotions, your physical well-being is prosperity. Your relationships, prosperity. Amen, a better marriage. Prosperity, your health. Your, and then we can get into resources, but resources are gonna be symptomatic of what's going on in here. This, this is where prosperity begins. He died and became poor so that you could become rich. If, if you don't like prosperity, then you need to get unborn again right now because you went from death to life. If, if that's not prosperity, I don't know what is. You went from darkness to light. That's prosperity. This, I'm talking about this, I'm on the same subject here. I hope you're catch, keeping up with me, but we're talking about what Jesus did so you won't stink. And po poverty stinks on any level. I've seen, I'm still rooting out vestiges of poverty in my thinking, in my emotions. I want it gone. I want, God is against everything that creates poverty. When people say, well, we just need to be humble. No, that stinks in this context. God is against everything that has created poverty in this earth. Why would you embrace it? Why would you make a doctrine to exalt it? Let's take a vow of poverty. Let's not. God is against sin. Sin caused poverty in the beginning. God is against ignorance. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Ignorance causes poverty. God is against laziness. Go to Proverbs 6, the sluggard. God is against laziness. God is against injustice. Governments are the root cause of much poverty in the world because they are unjust. They are not doing what God called them to do. And just because, well, what about the children in these countries? God is against that. But me being poor doesn't help them. God is against poverty everywhere. Injustice causes poverty. Sickness causes poverty. God's against sickness. I've given you five things right there that God is against. And people say, but it's, I just want to be humble. No, you're not humble. You stink. <laughs> You've allowed the, the aroma of death in you with small thinking, small vision, small dreams, if any, nothing. You just want you to make it just barely. And someday in glory... You go, you'll hate glory because there's no poverty there. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> it's just Andrew and Carrie next, so it doesn't matter. I'm gonna... <laughs> it's just more bosses. I have bosses everywhere. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> sadness, folks, is a part of the curse. I refuse to be under the curse. Amen. Bitterness is a part of the curse. I refuse to be under the curse. Amen. Anxiety is a part of the curse. I refuse to be under the curse. Depression is a part of the curse. I refuse to be under the curse. Amen. Guilt and condemnation are a part of the curse. When Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, it's that self-condemnation. Who can set me free? The cross. Hallelujah. There's a new smell on the other side of the cross. Yes, yes sir. Self-condemnation and guilt is a part of the curse. Yes. Suicidal thoughts are a part of the curse. Yes. We need, man, folks, if you're having that kind of problem, you need help. You need to come talk to somebody. You're, you stink. That is stinking thinking to think I'll take my life and somehow that'll make it better. How is that going to make it better? I'm a new creation. Are you a new creation? Let me do a couple, let me just do a couple more minutes here. Second Peter one, two through four. Second Peter one, two through four. 
Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Is that a good smell, grace and peace? And it can get better, multiplied. Verse three, it says, divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Does life and godliness smell good? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. That smells pretty good. Yes. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That smells really good. Yes. Amen. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Ooh, that really smells good. Listen to this. Having escaped the stink, the corruption. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to that stench. Don't try to be accepted by everybody. Walk with God. Walk with God. The corruption that is in the world through lust. John 10, 10, the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come. Jesus is putting himself in opposition to something that is the condition of this earth. Stealing, killing, destroying, the stink of immorality, of perversion. And Jesus says, I have come that they might have life. How are we going to reach the world if we don't smell like life? If we're doing the same thing the world is doing, if we're trying to be accepted by the world, and then people criticize you, you preach on healing, you preach on prosperity, and all of a sudden everybody comes up. But what about Job? <laughs> yeah, in Hebrews 12 too, it says, looking unto Job. <laughs> it starts with a J. <laughs> What's it say? Looking unto Jesus. These people that keep bringing up Job, take him to t Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, I'm not looking unto Job. Job stinks. Job had to repent for his ignorance. Jesus has come to set us free. He's come to set you free from small thinking. He's come to set you free from your human emotions that have ruined relationships. He's come to set you free from bitterness. He's come to set you free from death on every level. He wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. He's not out to get you. He's out to bless you. He is not the thief. God is not the thief. Any theology that says God is a thief, run. God is not your problem. The stench of this world is everywhere, but we have been graced with the aroma of life unto life. We have been graced with the mind of Christ. We have been graced with the Spirit of God. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the fruit of the Spirit. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus. We have everything we could possibly need. All the promises we just read to deliver us from the corruption that is in this world through lust. We should be smelling good, folks. And if you're still trapped in something that is stinking, you may think nobody knows. God knows, he wants you free. And it could be the people around you know. I was gonna say, look at your neighbor and say, but I won't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna finish up, I wanna pray with you, but folks, we have a, a God who is pressed down, shaken together, running over good. He is exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think good. We have a good God that is living inside of us and we should be smelling good. We should be free from all of the stuff that's going on in the world. I don't need to be impressing the people that are in Washington or impressing the people that are in Hollywood. They're dead, they stink. I want to be life. When people see my life, when people see your life, we should say, can you see it? Can you smell it? Look, I'm free. I'm free, stand up please. Amen. Praise God. Father, we declare we are free. We are free from the curse. We are free from every little sub curse, every little tiny curse, all the curses. We are free in the name of Jesus from the stink of the curse, from the stink of sin. We declare ourselves free. You are the greater one who lives in us. We are free from the power of sin. We are free from the power of sickness. We are free from the power of poverty. We are free from the power of small thinking. We are free from the power of fear. We are free from the power of dead dreams. We have living dreams. Praise God, you live in us. 
and you want to give us whatever our heart desires. Father, we are alive to you. You are alive in us. You are the creator of all things. You live in us right now. And you are wanting to burst out and change the aroma of our lives. And Father, we declare that is what we're going to walk in. We're walking in a new smell, the smell of life. In the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. When, when he said he had two minutes, Javier sitting here goes, that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, this has been good. It has been good. I, I just praise God for all the good things he's done. Let me just real quickly say thanks to everybody who's made this happen. Mike and Carrie uh, are over all of our carries and over all of these things. But man, there has been an army of people working day and night and uh, just thanks to everybody. It, it smells good. I know that many of our staff are out in the hallways putting things together. But if you are staff here at Andrew Womack Ministries of Karis Bible College, could you stand as well? Even if yeah. you're a student. Amen. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys Amen. so much for all you've done. And then when you see the staff out there in the hallways, just make sure to thank them. They have not only been preparing and have been working this, they have been praying over you. They have been praying for what you were going to receive from the Lord. So praise God for that. And again, thanks to Mike and Carrie. You know, it's, uh, I've, our ministry is larger than it's ever been. We're doing more things than we've ever done. And I've got more time off than I've ever had. <laughs> And it's because of all of our staff. I, it's just awesome. Amen. It's awesome. All right. Well, we're going to take some time here. So we have some questions that you guys have asked. And uh, we're going to ask Andrew Womack. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the questions was, who, who's your favorite teacher at Karis? I, I can't answer that. I love them all. And you know, this is one of the things that makes our ministry, I think, unique, or not unique, but, but good, is the fact that every single person contributes something. And if we were all like me, this would be a very boring school. And so we, we all together, we fit. And so, honestly, I love them all. Amen. I hadn't got a favorite. I love all of them. Amen. Okay, so um, I know we've been talking about, um, uh, for those that are, you know, here and praying about Karis, but the, one of the questions is, what is the key to timing? When you talk about timing, that um, they said, I want to come, but it's not the right timing. How do I pre prepare for when the time is right? Well, I would say that if God has placed something on your heart, you start moving in that direction. And if you've got, you know, we don't deny that you've got a house to sell and that you've got a business that you've got to uh, get somebody to take over and things like that. But I'm saying start moving in that direction. I often say that if you put motion to your boat, well, then the rudder can direct you and stuff. But if you're sitting still, you can flip that rudder 360 degrees and it doesn't do anything. So just start moving in that direction. Start telling people, start making plans and God will show you. And it may take you a period of time to get something done, but I wouldn't just sit there and wait on something to happen. I would start moving in that direction and God will make it clear whether it's now or if it's next year or something like that. And I know um, I've met a number of um uh, attendees that are, they're 14, 15, 16. And they've said, oh my gosh, I really want to come to Karis. And you know, I, I spoke to one the other day and I said, well, by the time you get here, we're going to be even better. We're going to be even bigger. We're going to be more awesome. And Barry's going to care less what you think. Um, cause he's going to be older. And so <laughs> there is something to add. The older you get, you just don't care. <laughs> It's like people want to reject you and say, I've been rejected before and I survived it, so it doesn't matter. Amen. 
And for young people, you can get such an identity in Christ that you also just don't care what people think. Amen. But for our young, um, uh, for our youngsters in the room, uh, can I just tell you, we have so many things that could prepare you for when it is the right time. I know some of you are finishing high school. We've got our Karis um, University series. We got Relationship University. We got Leadership, uh, excuse me, Healing University. We're just almost finished with Leadership University. Plus all of the biblical worldviews, I would encourage you. In the next couple of years that you are finishing up high school, put that stuff inside of you. If you could put those things inside of you before you come here, you will be Amen. white hot, on fire, Amen. focused, be some of our youngest, best on fire students we've ever had. If you would make the commitment to not wait two or three years to sow into your relationship with God, but do it now. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, one of the questions is, my spouse is fine with me coming to school, but doesn't want to attend himself. I really want us to do this together. How do I convince him it's important? <laughs> Man, you have to have a word from God on that one. There isn't a just one thing you do and it works for everybody. It depends on your relationship with them. We've actually had people come to the school where they came to school and left their mate back home thousands of miles away. And I, when that first happened, I said, man, this can't be God. I just don't believe that God would do that. And did you know that a person came here for two years and their marriage increased and it was better. And I mean, after the fact, I saw a follow-up. And so it can happen. You can do anything for a brief period of time, but, um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's tough when you're dealing with a mate. Mm -hmm. You know what I always uh, encourage people to do is you just, you just do what God tells you to do. Love them, respect them, tell you that you love them. And uh, over in first Peter, uh, or is it first or second, first Peter chapter three, I think where it says that if the husband won't be won uh, through the conversation of the wife, then you can win them without a word as they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So you can just be an example, but you're never, you're never going to improve a situation by compromising what God tells you to do. So you need to do what God tells you to do. And even your mate, you cannot control them. I actually saw a teaching one time that said seven steps to, I forgot the exact, seven steps to making your mate serve God or something. And I listened to it and it was witchcraft. You don't have the authority over your mate. Now you can sanctify them, 1 Corinthians 7, that means set them apart. You can release uh, God's touch on their life, but ultimately you can't control your mate. And anybody who tells you you can control your mate, it's a witchcraft. God doesn't control anybody. He holds your self-will uh, sacred. And so you just do what God tells you to do and don't be apologetic about it. I've actually told some wives before that, you know, they, they are always leaving my tapes around. They're dropping hints. They do stuff. <laughs> And I can't say that you can't do that, but you don't need to try and manipulate and coerce your mate. If you would love your mate with all of your heart, I think that Jesus would shine through so much. They would want what made you the way you are. Amen. And that's probably the best witness you could do. So kind of following that same question, um, this mom writes, I want my children to attend Karis. How do I make them want to come? Tell them you'll pay for it. <laughs> no, really, we, you need to exert some control. You can't control them once they graduate from school and once they get out on their own again, you can't control them, but you ought to really impress on them. Uh, I tell you, our school systems are just, they're bad. They're bad. And I know some people say, but there's Christians in there and they're believing God and trying to make it better. That's like saying that that uh, band on the Titanic was really good. <laughs> Just because there's some Christians in there that are doing the best they can. I tell you, our school system is corrupt. And for you to send your kids there is nearly uh, criminal. 
I mean, it's bad. You need to, you need to do something different. So I would encourage your kids to come to here, even if they have to go to a secular school because they've got to get some kind of a degree that we don't offer in order to fulfill what God called them to do. They ought to come here first and get grounded because the statistics are that like 80 percent or more of Christian youth renounce their faith after the first year of college. It is toxic. It stinketh. <laughs> Amen. And if you go around something like that, you're going to stink. So I didn't just encourage them. So um, many of our first year students, can I have our first year students give out a shout? All right. So we have some first year students that have asked me, I've changed so much in first year. Should I, should I come to second year? I mean, I've changed already so much. Should I come back? So second year, what would you say? So why should they come to second year? That's like saying, man, that was really good, but I don't know if I want more good. I think I'll just go back to, to the bad. No, you, man, you can't get too good. Man, it's okay to be a spiritual glutton. You need to come back. Matter of fact, when the Lord told me to start this school, I was opposed to a uh, Bible college because I'd seen people who graduated from it and I had a lot of material. And I thought a person, if they were really motivated, could just get the, the truth you know, through that. And I didn't see the need for a Bible college. But when the Lord spoke to me in 1993 over in England, uh, the second year is different. It is really practical. There is a lot of practical application. One of the major things is you have to go on a foreign missions trip. And there is a difference in just receiving and then having to give out. And I mean, we make people go in. There, this one guy, I don't know remember, if you remember um, Tom Decker. Yeah. You remember Tom Decker? But Tom Decker, he was an oilman and he retired and came to school and they just looked up on the internet and found that there was a Bible college in Colorado Springs. And so they came, they had never heard of me or anything. And they came and Tom was the biggest introvert. He made me look like an extrovert compared <laughs> to him. And he, I mean, for two years in school, I'd say, how are you Tom? And he'd shake his head. He never even responded and said a word. He was just so quiet. But he got hold of the word and on his missions trip, I think they went to Kenya or Uganda, one of those African nations, and we put him in charge of a service. <laughs> a guy who wouldn't even talk to you. He, was, he had the service and he was there by himself. And so he had to take the things that he had learned and speak it. And I wasn't there, but he told me about it. And he literally got up and just started speaking. The power of God fell and the entire church, hundreds of people were laid out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he couldn't even get them to come back up. The pastor was out of it. And so Tom just left, left the entire congregation. But he got so fired up that when he came back, he got in front of me and Linus Lefevre, the guy who was the director at the time, and he says, man, I've got to do something. What can I do to help you? And we had just had the director of our UK school quit. And so Tom and Leslie Decker moved over to the UK and took that over and for two years ministered in the UK. And I mean, that's what happens in the second year. You, it's important that you get your, your doctrine right, that you, ha you believe the right thing, but then ultimately it's, you got to put it into practice. And that's what the second year is about. It's real practical. And then the third year is even more uh, because what we do, we go into specific areas like Carrie heads up the DTP discipleship training uh, program. And that is specifically for people that want to help start a uh, Caris Bible college someplace in the world. We have a government school, we have worship arts, we have uh, film and production. We, business and ministry school. We got, what is it? Seven or eight different tracks, seven different tracks. And you get laser focused. And I mean, we got one guy that graduated from our business school. Samuel was his name and he was from Uganda. And he took the first two years, I believe in Uganda, but then he came here because uh, the, bus the third years are only offered here. So he came here. And when he went back to Uganda, they had a contest 
uh, over all of Africa, and I forget the exact number, but it was like 23,000 people or something applied for this grant. And Samuel, because of what he learned here, he put in his uh, project and it was chosen out of 23,000 people in Africa. He won and got a grant. And he now has a farm over there with multiple tractors. I don't know how many people, dozens of people working for him. He's supplying food. And he's told us specifically, he says, it's because of what I learned here. And did you know one of the reasons that we make you go through the first two years before you go into the third year is because we don't want people just learning business or uh, government or something like that, but not having the character and not having the right heart. That's not what we're about. We aren't trying to just get people to prosper financially. We're wanting them to prosper in their soul and then that will produce prosperity. So when Samuel went back, his uncle offered him all of the money that he needed if he would renounce Jesus and become a Muslim. And because Samuel had already been through the first two years, he decided if that's what it takes, I won't do it. And he just stood. And then this uh, contest opened up and he won it. And today this guy is prospering hand over fist and doing things because he had the first two years under his belt. He wouldn't compromise. And so... Anyway, it's all good. You ought to come for three years. And we got, we've got some people that have come for four and five years because mm -hmm. they want more than one third year track. Amen. It's really good. So is the goal for someone coming to Carries is the goal for them to become a full-time minister? No. For those of you, it's to help you fulfill whatever your calling is. And if your calling is to be a full-time minister, then yes, then that will be one of the things that comes out of it. But we need people that are in the marketplace, just like this Samuel that I was talking about. We need people, you know, I've got 1,100 employees and many of them, they clean the toilets and they clean the floor. And many people would think, well, they aren't in ministry. I guarantee you, they are in full-time ministry. We could not do what we're doing without every single person. All of the people that are in our productions, all of the AVL people, all of the people that are answering questions, that are facilitating the students. You know, one of the things that Carrie and Mike have been super uh, good at since they took over the school. How long have you been doing that? Uh, seven years. Though. Seven years. And since they came in, one of the things that they did, the, the uh, material is good and all of that, but we didn't have the student services. It wasn't a good experience and they have just been going out of their way to make the experience better and better and better. And because of that, it makes the people receive much better because their mind's not occupied with why isn't this working and stuff. So every single person that works in this ministry is in full-time ministry. We could not do what we're doing without them. And so people need to lose this concept that you aren't a minister unless you're on the stage. Man, I tell you what, if we didn't take care of this facility, God would not give us other facilities to trash. I believe that how you steward something is directly uh, related to how God will increase you. And we try and do everything we do with excellence and the people that are cleaning the toilets and cleaning the floors, that this is just as important as everything. And uh, we try and instill that in people. So God, it'll make you a better husband. It'll make you a better wife. It'll make you a better parent. It'll make you a better person working in a, in a business. It'll, it'll just change your life. There's nothing that uh, you do that this wouldn't help you do it better. Amen. And we need people in every one of those areas. Amen. Well, what if, um, what if someone doesn't know what they're called to? How about you answering some questions? <laughs> I, I can easy. answer, but you know, Carrie, man, Mike and Carrie are just doing a wonderful job. And what would you say? I should have asked an easier one. No. Well, I think that the thing is, is that you won't know who God made you to be until you know who God is within you. Amen. And so it's, that's why there's such an emphasis on find, then follow, then fulfill. You got to find out who you are. You got to find out how God made you. That's why so many of these uh, lessons this week was about you, was about you getting the word. And, and that's for even current students, you know, because sometimes people come to me even in second and third and you're like, I still don't know what God wants me to do. You just keep pressing in and falling in love with Jesus. And then what happens is your fragrance 
uh, is going to continue to open up doors. And so if you don't know the Lord, you don't know who he is with inside of you, then I guarantee you're constantly distracted with what you want to be and what God wants you to be, what you want to be, because you've never truly surrendered. And so I think that's one of the powerful things about being in the word. You learn who you are. And then when you graduate, and so we always talk, Mike and I always talk about this, that when you graduate, we, we wish we didn't have to give you diplomas. Instead, I wish we could give you birth certificates. Amen. That's good. Because I'm telling you, you're just getting started. That's right. And so we have some students, you know, we, one of the questions is, you know, how old is too old to come to Karis? Well, you're never too old to follow the Lord. Amen. You're never too old to, to throw it all in and say, here I am, Lord, I'm, I belong to you. So we've had 70 and 80 year old graduates that are now so productive in their life. They said the last two and three years since they've graduated, they've been more productive in the last two years than they were the decade before. Amen. And I'm just telling you, when you get into the word, that's what it does. It just, it causes a life to be birthed inside of you. You know, the thing that got me to seeking the Lord was trying to find out what God's call for my life was. And m most of you have heard me say this, but Romans 12, one and two is what God spoke to me. And that's what changed my life. And one of the things he showed me through that was that God's will for my life is not being a minister. God's will for my life is to be a living sacrifice. And that's what it's all about. And then how he uses me once I'm yielded to him, that's actually secondary. That is not the main thing. So when you're talking about how do you find God's will, God's will is for you to be completely yielded to him. That's what Carrie was saying. Mm -hmm. And this is what Karis does. It shows you how much God loves you. It shows you who you are. It shows you what your potential is. And it helps you to become a living sacrifice. And then once you do that, uh, you would have to rebel at God to keep from finding his purpose for your life. He will orchestrate things and things will work out. So, uh, man, you know, you don't have to know what God's will is, what his vocation for your life is. You just come and get to know God, mm -hmm. fall in love with him. And I guarantee you, you'll leave here with more purpose, more direction than you've ever had. It will stir you up. It's like, I think what the word does is it just draws you back it's like, you know, a bow and arrow when you got, God's drawing you back and he's preparing and preparing and preparing your heart. There's lies that are falling off. You don't stink as much. Amen. There's all those things that happen. And then when, when it's time, again, that release, you're heading in the right direction. Do you know exactly all the details? No, but that's, that's one of the joys of getting into the word is that you no longer have to know all the details. You no longer have to have the control of when and where and how and how much. You're just ready to be released into what God has for you. And you have faith and confidence that when you land, you're going to catch things on fire. Let me use this illustration. If those of you that are old enough to remember when you had film and you used to take a picture, what they did, they had emulsion that was on that film and it had all of the different colors in there. And so everything that you need was already there, but when you exposed it to light, varying uh, rays of light have different uh, wavelengths on it, and it would, it would not put anything new on that film. What it would do, it would penetrate and draw out the colors that were already there, and that's what made the picture. When you took a picture, it didn't put something on the film. What it did was penetrate and draw out the stuff that was already there. And so every one of us already have everything that you will ever need in your spirit, but it has to be exposed to the light of God's word. And it just draws out of you what's already there. And this is what the Bible college does. You're sitting under the word for four hours a day, five days a week for two or three years. And I guarantee you, it will take what God has already put in you, what he wrote in his book, before you were even born and it will draw those things out and you would literally have to fight to keep from having God stir you up and show you what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. You can do it. We've seen some people do it. I don't know why. I don't know why you'd come to Bible. We've had people that sign up and come to Bible school and pay for it and don't even come to class. What's the point? <laughs> and then we have other people come and sleep through class and stuff. So you can do it, but if you just give it half a chance, I guarantee you the Word of God will change you. 
We had this guy named Taj. Did you ever know Taj? He's a class below me. So Taj was a black guy from the inner city of New York. And when he came, the very first, he wore FUBU stuff. FUBU, hat, shirt, everything. I'd never heard of FUBU until Taj came. <laughs> and anyway, Taj, he told me the first day, he says, I don't want to be here. I am not going to receive anything. But his mother was a partner of mine. And she, you know, this goes along with one of those other questions. How do you get your kids to come? She, she told him she would rent him an apartment. She bought him a car and paid all of his expenses if he would go for just six months. And so he told me when he came in, he says, I don't want to be here. I'm here to get the car and all the other stuff. And he was a nice kid. He didn't have a bad attitude, but he, he just did not want to be here. And he told everybody, every time you talk to him, I'm, I'm only here for six months. And did you know, after being here for six months, he went home and he went back and he found out that two or three of his friends had, had been killed. He was in a section of Chicago where they had a person killed in that area every single week. And he went back and tried to plug back into his old friends and he couldn't do it. He had been changed and he didn't even want to be changed. He didn't come here to be changed. And so he came back and finished school. I remember he was on our, our first missions trip, uh, I think over to uh, the UK and we went to Arthur Burt's place and stayed there. And Arthur Burt was an associate with Smith Wheelsworth, used to travel with him. And Ta has just asked some of the most awesome questions. And, and it was amazing. And now the last I heard, he's pastoring a church down in Colorado Springs. And all of this happened through a guy that didn't even want to be here. So if you'll want to be here, it'll work better. But even if you don't want to be here, if you would just come and sit there, I think 90% of you would probably get changed without trying. It'll work. So um, March 23rd is the 55th anniversary of you being in full-time ministry. Congratulations. That's awesome. Amen. And, you know, many times you said that the whole reason starting the school and the teachers say this a lot so that we don't have to learn from the hard knocks. But say you were a brand new 20-something-year-old Bible college student and you were starting all over. What would be the most important thing you'd want to learn if you were coming to Karis? Well, in hindsight, I can tell you that, but when I was 20 years old, I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're young like that, you don't know what you need. But now I can go back and I can, you know, look at my life and tell you what's the most important thing. And I would say that for me, I had this experience that lit a fire on the inside of me. Emotionally, I was motivated. So motivation wasn't my problem, but the most important thing that has allowed me to last for 55 years is understanding who I am in Christ, my identity, which you were talking about earlier. And, and this is really a focus. I know that Mike and Carrie, this is one of the things, if you listen to them very long, you're going to hear about relationship, about your intimate relationship with the Lord. And this is, this is what God did for me. And when I found out who I was in Christ, it allowed me to break out of my, my flesh because I, I had a personality that was introverted. I was shy and all of these things and I felt captivated or captured by it. I couldn't break out of it. And when I found out that I was already everything that I ever wanted to be in the spirit, I was already that. Man, it just set me free to start walking in the spirit. And I didn't even try and change my flesh. I just started operating out of who I was in Christ. And now, it, you know, I've taken these personality tests and stuff. And when I take them, I test out a 10 out of 10 maximum extrovert. And yet I used to be just exactly the opposite. And it's finding out who I was in Christ that allowed me to do that. And so that would have to be the number one thing is my identity in Christ. Amen. It's what set me free. Amen. And that's one of your key courses in first year. Is and right along Christ? with that was the Word of God. Because if I hadn't have exalted the Word of God and began to start trusting what I saw in the Word of God, I wouldn't have ever accepted who I was in Christ. So I'd say that the emphasis on the Word of God and your identity in Christ are the two most important things I ever got. So you're writing some um, booklets right now. So of kind of 
encapsulating the last 55 years of like key revelations. So what are some of those first key revelations and what is your biggest revelation right now that God's doing in your life? Oh man, that's a big question. Again, I don't, uh, I don't know that I can say what my biggest revelation is now. It's like all of the things that God's shown me. I'm trying to juggle all of those things at one time. So I'm not focused on one thing. But Mike uh, Pickett, we were in one of our executive team meetings and I was saying, we need to do something to celebrate. This is major. And how could we get our partners and people to recognize this? And Mike's one that came up with, he says, why don't you start just talking about the major revelations that God has given you and share it with others. And so I was in Cancun two weeks ago and I spent a whole week, I wrote about 30 pages of stuff. And I, it's still, uh, I've got, I don't know how much, a lot more to go. But I, I just started thinking about what were the revelation? It's the, it's the truth of the word of God that makes you free. And so I actually went back 65 years to when I was eight years old. And the first revelation that ever really hit me was about hell because my pastor preached a sermon on hell. And it just shocked me to, he was saying that good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell. It all depends on whether you accept Jesus. And there's going to be good people by the world standards that go to hell. And there's going to be bad people by the world standards that go to heaven because they accepted salvation. And that was important. But the thing that really got me, and this is something that, uh, I don't think most people who even speak out and try and counter lies and the unbelief that's in our world, most Christians that do that don't get specific enough to really drive the point home. They, they're apologetic. And so one of the things that this pastor did, he started naming names. He was naming people that I had heard of, eight years old, people that you know were on shows, movies, people that were singers, people that were politicians, names that I knew. And he started calling their names. They're going to split hell wide open if they don't repent. Most people won't do stuff like that. But see, if he had just presented a general truth, that might have interested me. But when he started calling names of people that I just thought, no, they would never go to hell. Uh, boy, that got my attention. And so I didn't respond at church that day. But when I got home, I asked my dad, I said, man, what is this? Uh, and he began to explain to me and show that we were all born in sin. And I mean, my dad, the second revelation was he told me that it's not what you do. It's not the good go to heaven and the bad go to hell. It's what it's whether or not you accept Jesus as your savior. And he explained that to me. So my second revelation was about that it was all based on what Jesus did. And the only part I had to play was just to either believe and receive or doubt and do without. And when he shared that with me, I got born again right there in my bedroom with my dad praying for me. So those two revelations are what really started the whole thing. And then when I was uh, 18 years old, is I had become a religious Pharisee because I went to church and they basically were telling me that God will answer your prayers and love you and move in your life proportional to how holy you are. And so I determined I was going to be the holiest person that ever lived. And I mean, I've, I've lived a holy life. I lived holier than anybody I knew. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that I honestly tried serving God with everything I had. I'd have given up bubble gum if I'd have thought it pleased God. I'd have done anything. I was seeking God with my whole heart. And, but I began to start trusting in my goodness. And because I was doing better than anybody I knew, I honestly thought I was awesome. <laughs> and I looked down my nose at other people. And what happened on March the 23rd, God showed me his glory and, you know, compared to people, I might look good, but man, when, if you ever get a revelation of who God is, uh, you'll repent in sackcloth and ashes. There's many scriptural examples that every time the glory of God was revealed, people just uh, hated their own self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, I believe, is a worse sin than adultery, homosexuality, murder than anything else. And I was totally self-righteous. And so when I saw that, that was really good for me. 
And I don't, I think this is why a lot of ministers don't make it is because they don't have a knowledge of who they are without Christ. They see, they see who they are in Christ and man, that's essential. And I'm certainly supportive of that, but you need to balance both of these things. Isaiah chapter 59 verse one says, those of you that are seeking after righteousness, look to the rock from which you are hewn. That's Jesus. And look to the hole of the pit from which you are digged. You're supposed to be looking at both of those things. You need, you know, again, I'm saying this just to brag on Jesus, but look at the good things that Jesus has done. And man, I'm just so thrilled with what Jesus is doing, but I constantly remember that night. And I can guarantee you without Jesus, I'm a big zero with the rim knocked, knocked off. I'm a nothing. And I think that really, really helps me to keep my feet planted on the ground and give God the glory and stuff. And Amen. so anyway, we could just keep going and going and going and going. And I've now got about 15 or 20 of those revelations like that, that have shaped my life. And I've probably got 30 or 40 to go. So which one's most important? All of them. There's not a day that goes by that I don't remember March the 23rd, 1968. And I remember that, man, I thought God was going to kill me when I saw how ungodly I was. And instead of killing me, he poured his love out on me. And man, I've never gotten over that. I have never gotten over that. I remember that every day of my life. Everybody needs to be able to look back and remember that it's, God, just like this up here says, it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And if you ever forget that and get to, you know, just focused on what's he showing you right now. Well, he's showing me things right now, but I'm going back to the very beginning. You got to keep all of those things in play at all times. I believe there's going to be revelations for those that are coming and those are already here. There's key revelations that God is wanting to reveal to you that are just as life-giving and significant. I know for me, honestly, when I was in Bible school, the biggest revelation I got, and again, I grew up in Pastor Lawson's church. And so, you know, when he was up here yelling, oh, he really yelled when I was a little girl. He'd rip off his coat and run across the front row, <laughs> spitting. It was amazing, okay? And uh, you never fell asleep in church. Um, but you know, when he talked about, you know, I am blessed, I'm blessed coming in, I'm blessed going out, I'm blessed in my health, I'm blessed. I remember hearing that all my life growing up and hearing, you know, the finished work of the cross. But it was actually when I came to Bible school that I learned intimacy with God. I'd had this great relationship with God. I'd had this great, you know, dynamic of being in the word. But it was during that time I got a revelation of what it meant to have relationship with almighty God. And when you get those revelations, they stay with you for the rest of your life. And I just want to challenge you. You don't want to miss those revelations. You don't want to miss it. And so even for those of you that are already students, it's how you come to hear as well. You're coming expecting revelations that are going to change your life. Amen. And I've heard you, Carrie, talk about when you were in Russia. And man, she went through poverty. She went through rejection. Here she was a single woman over there in a society that didn't really appreciate women in <laughs> ministry. And you could just name thing after thing. And it was that relationship mm -hmm. that kept her going. You, you can't get enough knowledge to sustain you. Knowledge is important, mm -hmm. but it just opens you up to relationship with God and stuff. It's how, we wouldn't know how to spell Jesus if it wasn't for the Bible. <laughs> and so you need the knowledge, but this knowledge leads you to relationship with the Lord. And Amen. that's what you're talking about. Amen. And that's a strong point. I've heard Carrie minister many times and she will always, Amen. always bring something out about relationship with God because that's what it's all about. Yep. You know, uh, first Corinthians 8, 1 says, knowledge puffs up, or maybe it's 8, 2, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Amen. Knowledge is essential, mm -hmm. but if you just stop at knowledge, you, you're going to be nothing but a sound in brass and a tinkling cymbal. You need to have an intimate relationship with God. And we can't just impart it to you, but we're going to model it for you and tell you about it so often that if you're listening, I guarantee you, it'll change your relationship. It's awesome. So in our last few minutes of this Campus Days 2023, how many of you have been blessed? Amen. 
Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for answering these questions. But as we as we finish up, what would be your parting word? Parting word to those who are thinking about coming and to those who are already here having placed themselves in this environment. You know, when Joseph, uh, Pastor uh, Lawson was talking about Joseph and when Joseph finally revealed himself to his brethren, he told them to go back and get their father and all their families and come back. And then he says, and see that you fall not out by the way. These people had been against him. There was a possibility that they would go back and never come back. And he says, see that you don't fall out by the way. If God has spoken something to you, just see that you do it regardless of what it costs you. And I can guarantee you that Satan is going to try and uh, make you think that, man, the effort that it's going to take and what about my finances and this? Just if God has spoken something to you, do it. If it hair lips the devil, do it. Just do it. And this is an attitude that I have. Once I know that God has told me to do something, I'll do it. I don't care what the results are. And uh, I know that some people say, well, that's easy for you to say. Well, it's really not easy for me to say. I've been through things where honestly, when we started on television, God told me to go on television. And yet it was way beyond me. And we made commitments that if God didn't come through, our ministry would have been over in uh, January of 2000. And I mean, I rolled the dice in a sense. I put everything I had into it. And if, if I hadn't heard from God, it would have totally destroyed the ministry. And I could name dozens and dozens and dozens of times like that. And so once God tells me to do something, I just do it. And I encourage you to do that. If God has spoken to you, just do it. One of my teachings that I have that I, I like the best, very few people request this. It's one of my least requested teachings is uh, the four keys to staying full of God. And it's based on Romans 1, 21. And there's four things that you do to walk away from what God has spoken, to let Satan steal it from you. And the first thing is you don't put the right value on God. You don't glorify him and value what God says. And uh, anyway, I, I've got a whole series on that, but you need to put value and not think that this is just emotional, that we got you here and it was the music and it was the beautiful mountains and it was this and it was just emotional. If God spoke to you, you need to drive a stake in the ground and say, this was a word from God and in the name of Jesus, I'll never back off of it. And that you gotta have that attitude. Uh, Mark, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is preached and it suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And you got to get violent to where, you know, once God has spoken to you, I'll, I'll do this. If it costs me everything I've got, there is no turning back. You got to burn your bridges behind you. And I can say that Jamie and I, if we would have had any quit in us, we'd have quit a long time ago. Carrie, when she went to Russia, she had lots of things happen. If she would have just been trying it, she wouldn't have done it. You just got to say, God has spoken to me and I will get it done. And you don't have to do it perfectly. You can mess up along the way and you can make mistakes as long as you're still heading in the direction that God gave you. You don't have to worry about doing it perfectly. He doesn't demand that, but, he, but you do have to continue. When the disciples were told to go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it's only a two hour trip across there. I've been on the Sea of Galilee in the Jesus boat is what they called it. And we anchored in the middle of the sea and I taught for two hours about all the things that happened right there. But anyway, it only takes two hours to go across the Sea of Galilee. They left at sundown and in the fourth watch of the night, which means it was between three and 6 a.m., they were only halfway across because the wind was blowing against them. And that's when Jesus came walking on the water and they experienced that miracle. Everybody wants to experience a miracle. But you know, if the wind was that much against them, all they had to do was turn that boat around and head back to shore. And they could have been at the safety of the shore in just minutes. And yet like nine hours later, they were still moving in the direction. They weren't real faith giants. They were scared to death, but they were committed. And because of that, the Lord came out and they experienced that miracle. 
You don't have to do everything perfectly, but just once God speaks to you, do it and don't quit. If it kills you, do it. <laughs> Amen. I'd rather die trusting God than live doing it my own thing. You know, we said this before, God, God didn't create you to be ordinary. Now he, he created you for his spirit. And I just want to give you one last verse as we wrap up today. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, God uses this scripture to speak to me on a lot of things, but he was speaking and he said to the children of the he said, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He said, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Do you not perceive it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. I think that's the thing. When God's starting to do a new thing, you and I have to recognize, okay, God's doing something. Versus like, shh, 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 God, shh. Let me do my thing and I'll come back to you when I'm ready. When God starts doing a new thing, when he starts stirring up something new in your heart, one of the biggest things you and I have to do is perceive it. That he's doing a new thing. Does that mean we know how it's going to work? No, because he says that he will make a way. He will make the road in the wilderness and he will do what? And rivers in the desert. So he provides the direction and the path and the provision and the sustenance. And so I'm just going to encourage you, don't don't look back to the former things. Don't go back to the former ways you looked and smelled. Amen. Because God has something new for you today. Amen. Amen. And I know there's many of you, this is, we have things that we're going to be doing this afternoon that are powerful. We have our Karis night of worship tonight. This is going to be powerful. Okay. You know, we did this, this every morning. Try that this evening. Oh my goodness. So guys, I'm going to encourage you come back because it's also in worship that the Lord's wanting to speak to you and solidify. So please join us. We're having our Karis Fair next door. And so go there, check it out. I believe there's going to be some divine appointments of God making a road in the wilderness and streams in the desert. He's going to show you when and where and how and how much. And so please go check that out. But and let me pray. I want to pray for two groups. I want to pray for those of you who aren't sure whether you're supposed to be here. And then I want to pray for those of you who are sure and just agree with you. So first of all, let's have those of you that are still debating. You haven't made a decision yet. I want you to stand and we're going to pray. And if God doesn't want you here, we don't want you here because we've had some people here <laughs> that are a pain and they stink. So... But if Amen. you aren't sure, I want you to stand. I'm going to pray Praise for you God. real quickly. The bell will probably ring during this second prayer, but uh, anyway, we can go a few minutes longer. So if you're still debating, I just want you to stand. I'm going to pray this won't work if you're seated. If you're still debating, you got to humble yourself and stand to get this. So Father, we just pray for them and we want your will. Father, and I know that there's many different ways that you lead people, but if you're leading them here, I pray that every confusing thought is gone. It says that you aren't the author of confusion, but of peace. And I believe that you just speak to them and give them a supernatural peace. We are your sheep. We hear your voice. And we stand on James 1, 5, that if anybody lacks wisdom, all they have to do is ask of God and you'll give it. And we don't waver in our faith. We believe that you are speaking and showing them exactly if they're supposed to be here or someplace else, or maybe they're supposed to come some other time. We just thank you, Father, and we receive it and believe that they're leaving here with a peace in their heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all agree with that? Amen. Amen. All right. So for those of you who have made the decision to come stand, and we want, you, we want to pray with you and believe that God is going to work everything out. Amen. Amen. So Carrie, you pray over all of these that have made the decision to come. Well, Father, I thank you that we hear your voice and another we will not follow. And Lord, I thank you that because we know your voice, Lord, there is peace in it. There is provision in it. So Father, I just thank you 
for this new season, this life-changing season, each and every one are getting ready to enter into. And Lord, I just thank you for excitement within their heart. Amen. And when things try to rise up, when they go back home and people tell them, what, are you crazy? They're able to say yes for Jesus. And so Amen. Father, I thank you that they will not thank listen to Jesus. other people's voices or opinions or situations you, voices. And so Father, I thank you that like uh, Andrew said, they're not gonna turn away, but Lord, it is for such a time as this. And because they're standing, because of this season, there's going to be supernatural healings. There's going to be supernatural prosperity. There's going to be supernatural provision in relationship. Things that have been broken are going to be restored. And we just prophesy that. And we prophesy to all the things that are coming and that you have it by your hand. And so, Father, we just speak a blessing. Just protect them as they go forward and as they come back. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo! We're so excited. So guys, the booth out there, please, for those of you that are still considering it, maybe you haven't finished, and this, is, this has been the last thing. I'm going to make a commitment. Let's do that. Praise God. I'm going to just bring up uh, Claire and Mark for any remaining announcements that I forgot. Okay, instructors. Instructors, if you could... Well, we have come to the end of our campus days. I'm sad. I don't know. I know. It's been so good. But it, is it has, awesome. hasn't yeah. it? And it's been encouraging. And it's yeah. just like, man, I was looking, I was just enjoying this. Yeah. Yeah. What about our worship team? Oh. Hasn't the worship just been phenomenal this whole yeah. session? Yeah. And the beauty of that is if you do decide to take the step to become a student at Karis Bible College, you get that worship a minimum of twice a week. It's yeah. just, it's phenomenal. They do that such an amazing That is something we do job. every Monday and Friday. Yep. We do that in the mornings. Yep. And guys, just to encourage you, that is actually a year three program here at Karis yes, Bible College. Is. So you do yes. want to check that out. You can come and join that. Yes, that we awesome. have many year three programs. Yep. So, you know, We've said this before, but if God is tugging on your heart and you think that Karis Bible College could be the next step that you want to take, we want to yeah. encourage you, just take that step. Pick up the phone and call our amazing enrollment team. Yeah. What's the number, Mark? Number is 844-360-9577. And the website will be carersbiblecollege.org. So guys, our team that is waiting for you to take your call will answer every single question you Amen. have, whether that be about a campus, the programs, everything. They have all Amen. the answers for you. So yep. please do call in, don't hesitate. Yes. So we just want to thank you so much for joining us over our Karis Campus Days. It's been an honor for oh, us yes, to just be is. part of it all of been. this. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. We hope to see you here on campus or yes. perhaps just reach out because we have campuses all over the world pretty yes, much, nice. right? So, please do. Yeah. so take that step. We encourage you. You will not be sorry. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll see you around no, here man, on campus. Be, good. be yeah. sure to say hi if you do end up here. But God has good plans for you. Amen. And Amen. all you have to do is just take that first step. Just be so obedient. we encourage yeah. you. Just Amen. Just be an obedient. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So thank you once again. God bless you. And we will hopefully see you soon. See you soon.